All right, my name is Tim. Welcome to the College of Complexes. I'd like to uh, welcome everybody here tonight. The College of Complexes consists of the following format. First, we'll have a brief announcements period. Then our speaker, Brad Ahrens, will speak for up to about an hour or so. Then he'll take questions. At the end of that question and answer period, we'll have our infamous rebuttal period where we'll be able to uh, sound off whether on or off topic. And uh, Brad will then get the last word. We generally go till about nine o'clock or so, but seeing as how we're on Zoom, if it goes a little longer, a little bit shorter, we understand. Um, with that point, there are two two rules the college one is no personal attacks and the other one is one fool at a time and we all know we, we all know what the scriptures say about fools they're not interested in understanding but only in the revealing of our own mind we'll see a lot of minds revealed tonight okay and uh it also means i can't call charlie a schmuck but <laughs> never Too mind now uh, well, anyway, too late now. All right, uh, Charlie, if you're ready, I'll share the schedule and you can go through the uh, upcoming illustrious uh, speeches you want to go through. So um, when you're ready, let me know. All right. Welcome to meeting number 3,637 of the College of Complexes, the playground for people who think. Okay, first of all, as usual, we have a relatively new Google email group, which I recommend everyone subscribe to. You get one or two notices a week. And we also have that operate pretty much the same fashion. And I guarantee you, we have a meetup group. You get one or two notices of the upcoming program for that coming Saturday. Although I am not a capitalist, I will give an advertisement for our upcoming programs. What? On October the 16th, no. we're having a, uh, an academic no, and criminology uh, uh, who will talk Wait. about seeing hey, all right, let's mute whoever that is, please. We're having someone talk on senior fraud prevention in person, over the phone, and online. During the week, I posted an article. There was a Microsoft News was saying, uh, had, a, had a bulletin alert. So this is a very, very, the way you're ripping off seniors. That's a free market capitalism for you. They'll yeah. cheat you any chance they can. Uh -huh. I get these calls too. They're crazy, man. Okay, October the 16th. October the 23rd, we'll have the opportunity to discuss the COVID car conspiracy. Jim Pfizer, conspiracy specialist, <laughs> uh, founder of the 9-11 Truthers, uh, uh, will be here to give us a presentation. He has, matter of fact, I sat through his two-hour program. There's a link to it on the site. He'll compress it down to one or less. October the 23rd. On November the 6th, Marsha Williams, who has declared a candidacy for the Congressional Office of the 16th District of Illinois, will be joining us. She has three issues, universal health care, that Green New Deal, and criminal justice reform at, as, the, as her main uh, campaign platform. So it should be a good program. Uh, her campaign chairman is excited uh, to be joining us. On November the 13th, uh, Peace Advocates here. Janice was talking about no military budget, but Pache Abene, a long-term uh, peace activist organization um, will be joining us and talking about uh, their nonviolent service, which is uh, rather interesting. So it should be a good program. On November the 20th, uh, the Coalition for the Infrastructure will be here. That's currently before Congress right now, a matter of debate and certainly important uh, issue uh, 
if in any transportation perspective. So the coalition, uh, they want to have a special way of funding uh, the infrastructure. Okay, following that, on November the 27th, Jan Lee will be returning um, with a talk on racism. Our concepts of racism, she maintains, are out of date. On December the 4th, we return to ecological topics and the chairwoman person of the Illinois Environmental Council will tell us they just issued it. They did an Illinois scorecard to see how green the elected representatives in the General Assembly of Illinois were and bring us up to date on um, Illinois issues regarding the environment, where all of you live, by the way. Yeah. This is important. This is a, these are, I have been involved in doing these scorecards. And let me tell you, there's an, an awful lot of work, even with computers and so forth. So I can appreciate, I do this for the Illinois, uh, voters of Illinois, independent voters of Illinois. And there's no way around it. It's simply man manual tallying, but there's a lot of work involved in, in compiling one of these scorecards. Okay, now that leaves open December the 11th and December the 18th. Um, I, If anyone would like to speak who hasn't spoken before or knows of an organization we should invite, yeah. an individual, please let me know. I have a program in reserve, if need be, in which I show how we must terminate all logging whatsoever, shut down the entire lumber industry of the United States, why we should do it right now and immediately. But anyhow, if you'd like to speak, by the way, January 8th, I believe would be the next program. If anyone's got any ideas about, uh, making for the coming year, uh, what do you call them? Um, resolutions or predictions or something like that. Put together a program, participant program. We occasionally do that. Okay, Tim, that's it. Take it. Oh, oh by the way, I left out. Um, I left out another speaker. November 30th. I left out, uh, uh, Adam Broad will be here from the Illinois Green Party. Oh, good. I'm sorry. Yeah. I left that out. Adam Broad uh, is running for Congress. Uh, some of you may remember, he gave us a very good lecture uh, for nationalizing the health care of the United States. But uh, Adam Broad on November the 30th. Oh. October the 30th, October 30th. That's it, look it over, take it away, Tim. All right, uh, we were, are now, uh, is there any other announcements from the uh, people in, in the peanut gallery around us here tonight or not? Okay, um, then let's, uh, Brad, if you're ready to present, uh, the speaker is yours, I'll, uh, Go ahead, and uh, again, I'd like to welcome everybody for coming. So, Brad, go ahead and take it away. Good evening, everybody. Hope you're doing well. Make sure you mute yourself so Brad has a complete. Uh... All right. Is, is my mic working still? Or we're good? Okay. You're working just fine, sir. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, this should take roughly 40, 45 minutes to get through. I'm going to tell you about myself and where I'm from. I'm a regular guy. You know, if I eat my fiber, <laughs> no, no $500 suit here. You can see no tie. I don't do that because men make clothes. Clothes do not make men. The agenda for tonight is to tell you who I am, what I'm about, and what motivates me. It's not so much a speech in the classic sense, but more like me talking to you. I'd say on the order of a TED talk. I'll tell you a few stories, and we know we can learn a lot from stories. 
Uh, during this time, I will present a new idea, or at least it's new to me, and you'll be the first people to hear it. So I'm going to bounce it off of you. At the end, I'll go over my best way that I know to talk to right wingers and pull them a little left. And then we can talk about whatever you want. So pick your feet up. Drinks are in the fridge. Section one, where I came from. Whether you came by phone booth or DeLorean, welcome back to 1988. When I was about 13 years old, I was at my grandma's house. No, it was nowhere near Halloween, just something I came up with. I put some orange felt, a pair of sunglasses, and a green vest on her chair, and I asked if I could use her sewing machine. Obviously, she knew what I was really asking, but she was a whiz at it. She asked me, what are you making? A superhero costume, I said. A superhero costume? Well, great. Do you have a name picked out? Yes, Dark Angel. I'm not sure I understand. What does it mean? Angel, because they can convince people to do what's right and don't have to use force. And Dark, because he asks for nothing in return and nobody knows his name. What a great idea. It sounds exciting. Come over here so I can measure your neck. For the cape? Yeah, for the cape and for the vest too. Do you know why? Why, Grandma? Because no matter what the bad guys throw at you, you got to be able to hold your head up high. And you know what? What? I like how slippery the vest material is. Great choice. You do? Yeah, it'll make it easy to wipe off the dirt when you get knocked down but you will always dust yourself off and stand tall like a real superhero. And don't you forget it. So Bill and Ted types, we're gonna fast forward to 2018. But before I continue, let me throw a factoid out at you. Suicide rates increased 33% between 1999 and 2019. I would say a good indicator of increasingly oppressive state of our society. I'm no exception. I too struggled with depression and suicidal thoughts. One night, this previous scene crossed my mind along with many other thoughts. There's only one way out and it's not in a positive way. It involves weighing out the quickest, easiest, non-messiest death you could do on your own versus the aftermath of the event. No one should have such a mindset, but I did. I finally ended up in the cornfield and sitting in the rain. I had given up completely. The rain stopped and the moon shone down on me and it looked angry. And I started to feel angry too. No one should ever feel useless or worthless. And I intend to make sure of that. My inner weakness became my inner strength. I was ready. And now the final piece. I never did have a logo, but here's my logo now. I'm not Superman. I have no superpowers. As grandmother told me, she can't sew any magic into the cape to allow me to fly. So am I Batman? No, I'm Robin. Why Robin? Because he fought the same supervillains, but without the toys, without the training, without the vehicles. While everyone left in his space and told him he would fail. He did it anyway, despite the odds, using only his grit and willpower. He came from nothing, a circus freak. Every superhero exists for one reason, supervillains. If not for supervillains, superheroes wouldn't even need to exist. The problem is, they wear capes too. And if you aren't careful, you can mix them up. Section two, examining the landscape. Why does poverty even exist? We allow it. Why does war exist? We allow that too. Why are there homeless? We allow it too. No, really, we step over a body laying in the sidewalk like he isn't even there. We can easily disallow these things. You know who tells us that we can't fix these things? The ones who keep it from happening. Follow the money. 
So let's talk a bit about poverty. Number one issue for me, I've seen it, I've lived it. All my friends have. It's been estimated that we produce enough food to feed 10 billion people. There's not yet 8 billion people. Why is it still an issue? It's definitely not to supply. We can put food on a truck, take it to the airport, and fly it to the other side of the world fast enough that it doesn't even need refrigerated and will still be good when it gets there. It's not a distribution problem. Yet millions starve. How is this so? We've all heard it a thousand times, especially from the Republicans, but moving on. Why can't they grow their own food? We blame the victim, as we always do, so we don't have to think about it, and we don't have to solve it. Well, what can I do? That's our favorite excuse. Even worse, we have Christians ignoring the words in red as if they don't mean anything to them. So, speaking to any Christian friends here, giving it to God also doesn't work. I hear you saying, <coughs> what? What do you mean? What I mean is, it's not God's problem. It's ours. We created the problem, not God. You'd think he'd have it solved by now. Why doesn't he? Actually, he did. He gave us free will and expects us to use it to solve it. How else can we learn anything? Section three, the status quo. Listen, folks, we have everything wrong in our society. It's all backwards. We follow along without questioning it. We're told we are individuals responsible for ourselves. Uh, no, wrong. We are a social creature who have evolved for untold millions of years together. And if we weren't, we'd have gone extinct long, long ago. When did we define responsibility as propping up terrible business plans? When was it my responsibility to, look, to work long hours doing meaningless, pointless, mind-numbing, demeaning work while being paid just enough to almost not starve to death? So that some guy who doesn't know my face and my name at the same time, if at all, can buy a smaller yacht to park inside his bigger yacht and his business can survive. Well, at least until he, he has his exit plan of being bought out and then I'm downsized of a job. Ask me how I know. How the hell is this not only a thing, but encouraged? Like if I don't do it, I'm just being lazy. I'm not lazy. I just won't be exploited for profit that I am not getting. At what point did we start taking temporary jobs? The quote unquote, for now, jobs that we will replace as soon as we can, which we won't because those jobs either don't exist or we end up working 60 hours a week or both. We have no time to look for another job. And what is a starter job anyway? Those jobs that teenagers get to for play around money, no such thing, doesn't exist. Not only do they not pay anything, but most of the people who do them are not teenagers. What's an entry level job doing requiring experience? It's a job for experienced workers by definition, but with no pay. The only reason these exist is because employers know that we're forced to take them in that increasingly smaller wages. New definition, job providers. These guys are not heroes, they're traitors. The communities that built them and support them aren't good enough for the greedy. Can't say that on a live. They hire Chinese workers so cheap they could sell this, they can send goods halfway around the world and still do it cheaper than building it here. And at whose expense, I might ask? Their own neighbors, you and me. They sold out America into warring applause. And when all fails, it's okay. Instead of the free market we claim to support, we bail them out. If that's not favoritism, I do not know what is. And as a craftsman himself, how does a craftsman compete with this? The answer is he doesn't because he cannot. By the time I build one piece, you could already have bought two. Thanks, Walmart. 
and I haven't even included the profit I aimed at making. Well, let me suggest something. I don't think we should be so cheap. Gone are the heirlooms. Gone is the quality. Oh, did you break it? Sorry. But that's okay. Let's just buy another one. Did you save $10? Well, sure you did in the short term. And in doing so, you got your neighbor fired for some dude in China. And all for what? I do not think your bookcase is supposed to smile at you. So please, everyone, stop buying junk. And on that note, we should stop importing Chinese goods altogether. But that's that's point. No more pressed wood. It is 80% glue. Enough of the impatience. Enough got to have it now. Buy something quality. Buy it locally. Pay a bit extra to get something that will last. Something beautiful. Oh, you can't? And whose fault is that? It's our fault. Americans' own fault. So let's accept that as our responsibility. We need to support each other. And if your neighbors make more money, so will you. Section four, the new status quo. Uh. Why are we discouraged from talking about our salaries with others? Whose idea was this? I encourage you to talk to your workmates. I encourage you to talk to the guy working for a competing company too. If we did this, we'd be looking through a glass door. Are you getting paid what you are worth? Would we uncover racism and sexism in our companies? I bet we would. I bet we'd discover a whole lot of things we're not supposed to know. But what I know we'd un un uncover for certain is that we're being treated unfairly. That being said, 80% of us work paycheck to paycheck. We can be terminated for the dumbest reasons. We can be canned at any time without warning. We have no company loyalty? No, in fact, it's the company that doesn't have loyalty for the employees. For example, my brother Chad, the Iceman, was one cool guy back in the day. He did the job of the manager better than the manager. Yet, they passed him over for a new guy who almost knew nothing. I just about started a riot over it. I got fired while in a heated debate with the regional manager, and I wore that as a badge of honor. Let me tell you what. They were still talking about it months later. We need to change our thinking. We need to do things differently, starting with speaking up. The very idea of grin and bear it so that you won't get fired offends me. That's something worth being appended over, by the way, not Tom and Jerry. <laughs> Just had to throw that in. There's no such thing as bringing jobs back from China. Even if there was, do we want them back, really? We'd have more of the same. We need better than we had before. We need reliable jobs. We need honest businesses. We need employees that are empowered as well as rewarded. We need to have businesses that are nurturing and allow growth. They need to be about the humans and not the profits. After all, it's the pursuit of happiness, not money. So let's start these businesses and create these jobs. And furthermore, let me tell you, distributed by, designed by, packed in, or on the behalf of, does not count. Made in USA. That covers it all, from the materials, to the design, to the building, to the chipping. Nothing else even comes close. Made in USA or nothing. Because it's the made end part that tells you where the money is going. And you and I both know it, it's not going to come back here. I hear thinking, but I can't buy it if it isn't made here. You're right. It's time to make made in USA mean something. So what's section five, the plan? Who sat down and planned our system? Nobody. There was no plan. Wouldn't it be better to have a plan than no plan? We know the status quo can't fix anything. It's been over 300 years, and if it were to fix the problems, it would have done so by now. It's time for a new plan. Normally, I define corporatism as one person reaping the rewards of the work of many people, like Jeff Bezos flying his dildo in the sky. But really, this definition has already been established. Oligarchy. 
hence oligarchic capitalism. And I'd say that's a good description of the situation here in America. I'd say if we are going to do capitalism at all, then let's do it the right way. We could take the good part or one who works hard and gets ahead and slam it into another concept we all know. We all work together for the good of the whole. Hence, socialist capitalism. Not sure it's a thing, but let's explore the idea. And this is the idea I want to bounce off you guys, and we can talk about it and what you think later. But for now, we'll describe it. We trade time for money, therefore time is our commodity. In the sense that we all have the same 24 hour days and we have the same amount of time to spend. If we are to work eight hours in a day, then how does one get ahead? If you produce more, you get paid the same. For example, if we were both bakers in the same bakery and you baked two cakes and I baked four and we clocked in and out at the same time, we'd be paid the same. If this is the case, then what's the maximum amount one can gain in any, gain, in any day? Given each person doing the same job, then it is simple math, three. Even in new math, eight times three is 24 hours. This is the flaw in the time for money concept. The workers cannot get ahead in the system, and I say the system is obsolete. The concept that I have come up with is not to trade hours from dollars, but rather, reward the effort itself. Productivity is the new commodity. Let me give you a for instance. If I said to you that you will do half the work, how much should you get paid if it pays $500? $20 if it takes us an hour, sound fair to you? I say that's garbage. I believe in the KISS, keep it simple, stupid principle. If I do half the work, I should get half of the profit. I call it the proper percentage of profit model. It operates as follows. One, partners can work any hours they want. So if they want to watch their grandson play baseball, they can. No one needs to get fired for living their lives. They can work long into that night if they sell shoes as well. This is the capitalism part. Number two, in this business model, there are no bosses and no employees. There are only partners and each equal to the next. This is the socialism part. To demonstrate this concept, let me talk about a business plan I created for a company called Wicked Voltage. It goes a bit like this. Employees are partners and partners are employees. Those words are interchangeable. There are several models of bicycle. Each one is scratch built from raw materials. Each bicycle has a plan and several jigs to help build it. The models, jigs, and plans are patented and belong to the company. Each one is custom sized, custom painted, and has a place for a custom design feature as requested by the customer. And they're pretty awesome because I built a few. Each bicycle has a nameplate that includes the model, the partner who designed the model, the company logo, the customer who it was built for, and the name of the partner who built it. Credit where credit is due. The company is owned and operated by the partners. Partners can develop their own models. There is no hierarchy and the company operates as a direct democracy. Though in some business models, they may employ some sense of hierarchy if they feel it's necessary. As orders come into the company, the work is offered to the partners. Each partner chooses which project to accept or takes the next one that's available. When the partner is done, he or she puts their own stamp on the product. This becomes, a, uh, excuse me, this becomes an automatic quality check as well as gives the partner a chance to make a name for her or himself like we used to. Customers may even request this partner to build a product and may offer extra pay for the privilege. Some advantages, number one, Nowhere is there a CEO making 350 times as much as the average worker in the same company while doing none of the work, I'll add. You heard it correctly, 350 times. Ask Forbes, that's where I got the information. 
<laughs> not $350 per hour, but 350 times. So if the secretary is making $12, the CEO is making $4,200. This exploitation of workers has been eliminated. Number two, partners can keep all of the profit from every build. If it sells for $200 and materials, tool usage, power, et cetera, cost $100, then the partner keeps the other $100 for her or himself. It doesn't matter if it takes four hours or just one. No one has to stay eight hours if they get their work done in only six. They are free to come and go as they please. And this brings up a bonus. We can eliminate traffic jams. The road system is sufficient enough to handle normal traffic, but not while everyone is on the same road at the same time going in the same direction. Whose dim idea was that anyway? Being someone who is more productive at night myself, it would work for me. And finally, number three, happy workers are productive. They want to be there and they want to work. What workers do not want is to be treated as expendable. They don't want to feel like drones. They don't want to be robots. They want to be productive members of society. Productivity is natural for humans. We don't need an incentive to do work. What we need is simply to fill our work matters. Excuse me, matters. The rest takes care of itself. No one wants to drag themselves out of bed with a sense of dread and we are not required to. The concept of workers who are also owners isn't particularly new. These are called cooperatives. I'm sure you, many of you have heard that. They exist and are very successful. So why do they work? Let me give you a few reasons. Democracy, self-help, self-responsibility, equity, equality, solidarity. They are intended to invest in themselves instead of the shareholders. I'm not really inventing something new, it's just evolving this concept to the next level and applying it to small manufacturing. If we want more mom and pop shops, and I think we all do, we should also bring back craftsmen. They kind of go hand in hand. This should be the core of our economy. We could build toys, bicycles, furniture, phone holders, and all manner of customizing amazing products far too long to list. For example, it's one of my designs here. <clears throat> Maybe you'll like this phone holder. Everybody likes kitty cats. Personally, I have made over a hundred designs and built dozens of prototypes. <laughs> Heck, most of them even worked. This is what I envision for the future. And if this becomes a thing, guess we were, guess where we would sell the products? Call up mom and pop the way it should be. So what's the core of our workplace now? In the last century, service jobs have gone from representing less than a quarter of all jobs to now representing nearly 80% of workers. <coughs> In other words, BS jobs that make people wonder what it is they do besides justify their existence. These are the folks who give presentations they don't want and no one wants to view. But if they don't do these things, they will reveal they don't really do anything at all. In which case, they could be replaced by the robot, nothing eight or 2000. A robot that doesn't exist and doesn't need to exist. We are expendable rather than irreplaceable. And the only reason low paying jobs that are paycheck to paycheck exist is because the guy at the top knows he will get away with it as we feel compelled to take the job as opposed to ending up on the street. We're forced into it and they know that. These days are gone if we say they are. So who's going to stand up to 325 million Americans? Not even a government can do that. So let's compare. I could tell you stories, lots of stories. In fact, it's one of the things I'm good at. Some that would make you appalled, some that would make you cry, but no story can I tell you that would make you feel inspired or happy because I have no experience in that. This is the short story about Big Steve, the little guy. Steve works at a factory, a factory that has very bad reputation and for good reason. 
He works every day for long hours and low pay. He struggles to pay rent. He can barely afford his clothing. He's a big man and he has a special order and you can bet it's very expensive that way. Steve got hurt on the job one day. They did not believe he was as bad as he said he was. They told Steve to come in at 4 a.m. to count and sort nuts and bolts. Yep, a job they made up on the spot. So, since Steve is my friend, I went to his apartment at 3 a.m. every day. I put on his boots, I put on his shirt, and I even put on his deodorant because Steve couldn't do these things himself. They finally paid him a few thousand to keep him quiet. But you know who they couldn't pay off? The guy who was smashed under tons of materials and almost ripped in half. You <laughs> did hear that correctly. But in a day or so, it was as if it never happened. So what we have is Steve forced to do a job they made up at my expense, no less, and another worker crushed under the weight of negligence and slave driving. But what we need, Steve, running his own small business, happy, healthy, and living the life he sees fit. So I ask you, what's it going to be? Send me in, coach. I'm ready to play. I'm not afraid. I laugh in the face of the rich and powerful. Mm. I say, you are worthless, not us. You are poor, not us. You are unrighteous, <laughs> and not us. We are the champions of prosperity, kindness, and love, and not you. We made you, not the other way around. You stole from us, and it's you that is the nobody. We are the other 98%. We're keeping the profits that we made from here on out. You got that? Just to clarify for any negative Nancys in the back of the bus, what's impossible? Going backward in time might be the only thing that is. We can't fly, did that in Kitty Hawk in 1903. We can't get to the moon, did that too. Can we take on the biggest Navy in the world? without even one single ship to our name. We finished doing that in 1783, or he wouldn't even be here. Do not ever forget who you are and where you came from. Are we the land of the American dream? No, we're the land of broken dreams. The question is, do you have your cape? Okay, I got two other little things I was gonna go over with you. First topic is, is world peace achievable? I say yes. Well, everything is related for starters. This is food for thought, but it's really not complicated in my mind. Imagine yourself with a full belly, a warm home, safe from the snow outside, and your friends and family surround you. And ask yourself, how many people do you want to shoot in the head? Zero, right? There's enough resources to go around. Everyone's basic needs could easily be met and then some. There's enough land, enough food, enough materials for all. We no longer need to fight over it. We spend so much on military agendas, it's ridiculous. In fact, it's embarrassing, especially when you talk to your friends from other countries, like I do. And I can't make up excuses. And it's just a fact. We can be seen too. Let's not pretend others do not have satellites hovering over our heads as well. So if your neighbor is doing actions which are hostile in appearance, would you be worried? However, if your neighbor is doing things that are peace-like, how would you feel then? And it's no secret that we spend more in military than the other next 11 nations combined. That includes China and Russia, if I'm not mistaken. So if we spent just half of that on peace instead of war, what would that look like? And last, let me ask this question. What military action can you take to make world peace? There's only one, nuke the whole world. And that's not the peace that we mean. I mean, it would be peaceful, all right, as soon as everybody was dead. And the last thing on my agenda here was to talk a little bit about how to talk to right-wingers. 
This can be demonstrated by continuing the story of the night where I found my strength that I told you earlier. You see, a very good friend of mine is a libertarian. <coughs> we spent many a night on his porch talking about the world. Many times our other friends would trickle in and out, sharing a cold beer and ice cream sandwich with us. But my libertarian buddy was the go-to guy, and he talked about anything into the night. So we walked the show <laughs> and got some snacks, which is something we normally did. The newspaper headline said, Mr. Lomaski is the fourth candidate for mayor. On the way back to his house, I said, you know what? I got an idea. I'm going to be the fifth candidate for mayor. The next day, I came to his house with the paperwork. He was waiting on the porch, smoking a cigarette like he normally was. And he said, you know what? I got a surprise for you. Let's go for a walk. After two blocks, I piped up. Are you going to run for councilman, right? He said, yep. <clears throat> so we started to make a roadmap and bounced ideas around. He focused on the infrastructure, and I focused on bringing back mom and pop shops. Let me tell you, as soon as you put your paperwork in the office and it's official, you'd better be ready. I got a call not even a day later asking me for an interview. During that interview, I said, I'm going to do it the old fashioned way. I'm going to knock on every single door and talk with everyone. And as one guy stood on his porch, he <coughs> said you were going to do it, and here you are. But there's one more thing, you see. There were two of us. We took turns knocking and opening up the conversation. The fun part was when they asked, are you guys Democrats or Republicans? And we simply said, nope. People responded to that, and they were hooked. By the end of my run, an almost magical thing happened. My libertarian buddy looked at me and said, so what's the website for the Green Party anyway? Sound impossible? Not really. Difficult, but not impossible. <clears throat> the fact is, there's no such thing as pulling someone to the left. When we argue, we argue from a left point of view. This either pushes the person further to the right or solidifies their position. The trick is two errors, one mouth. Listen twice as much as you talk. If you stand on the left, then do so and let them come to you. Let me give you an example. When talking about the pipeline, I broke it down into bite-sized pieces. I started with questions such as, would you agree that fossil fuels pollute? And would you want to risk a burst while it was running through your backyard? Of course, I threw in how you could see the pollution in the sky over LA. Have you also seen such a thing, I asked? Yeah, I've been to LA. It's a lot different than in rural Illinois. Yeah, sure is. With open-ended questions, I let him do the talking. It's quite easy to argue with me but it's harder for him to argue against himself. Seeing that I had successfully got him to visualize the pollution and associate it with the pipeline, I knew I had him. So finally, I asked, it's not really the pipeline project that you support, is it? It's really the workers and their jobs that you're concerned about, right? He replied, I don't want to see people lose their jobs. They need those to support themselves. Bingo. So what if they did similar jobs for the same pay, but without destroying the environment? Wouldn't that be better? Bango, he says. So here's my five steps to follow when talking to right-wingers. Number one, ask open-ended questions to put that person in a situation they are familiar with. For example, if talking about gay rights, ask if they were ever if they ever felt left out or if they felt excluded from something. Number two, talk like a right winger. Use talking points based on pride, loyalty, and family. These are their talking points, so use them. It's not like lefties don't talk about such things, but we don't think in them, but righties do. Number three, allow them to speak. 
Just because you can pound them with numbers and statistics doesn't mean you should. It works on us, not them. So keep in mind that you are not talking to a fellow lefty. This isn't your progressive buddy. Number four, let them make a comparison of a familiar situation to the one you're talking about. Don't force the conversation to be about the subject directly, but instead draw parallels between the two, such as, and how did that make you feel? And finally, number five, remember it's not a race. Do not rush it. If it takes 20 minutes for them to come around, it's a lot better than a four minute conversation where you both feel upset. You just argued again for 20 years and that's where we are now. It may seem to take forever, but believe me, you are saving time. And that's what I have for you folks today. So I'm gonna yield the floor back to you. Okay, uh, now time to unmute and ask your questions of our presenter tonight. Brad Ahrens. Brad, you, you do have a thing, but uh, Thank you, gonna... speaker. Oh, yes, Charlie, thanks. All right, who's got the first question? I have a question. Go ahead, Janice. Um, uh, Uncle Brad um, said something about CEOs earning 350 times more than the workers. Actually, I thought it was about 3,000 times more, but okay. <laughs> um, uh, and, while doing no work. Um, and that doing no work got me thinking. CEOs are paid what they're paid because they supposedly are going to make the stock, uh, you know, grow. <laughs> and that's what they're paid for. And this idea of stock options and stuff, that's what the problem is, isn't it? Actually, I think you're, I think you're kind of onto something there. Um, but over the, the pandemic so far, we have seen the stocks were not really affected that much by the, by the pandemic like you would think they are. And the fact is that many people associate the stock market with how well the economy is doing, but that's simply not true. And uh, the other thing was I'm trying to figure out a way to uh, kind of get ri rid of all that and move to a, a different kind of system where CEOs are not paid 300 million times or whatever it is, you know. <laughs> I'm definitely open to, to suggestions on that for sure. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'll have a question. Uh, I'm sorry, did you, I didn't read the description. Have you run for office? Are you in <laughs> office or um, I, I, I'm kind of interested in, you know, your experience and background and all that. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I did run for mayor in 2018 as the fifth candidate, and it quickly became a four on one. But the thing is, um, one of the reporters, he's been doing reporting for 30 years, and he said, I've never seen a candidate get quite as much attention as you. So I must have been doing something right. And I was talking then about starting things like, uh, uh, <laughs> shit my brain went blank but yeah I like it community gardens and things like that the, the using land that the uh the county already owns but they don't utilize and we're still paying taxes on things like that the, the only reason that i didn't win isn't because i wouldn't have won but i did have a felony on my record from like 13 years ago and it wasn't that big of a deal really but uh that barred me from any local office, but it doesn't bar me from US federal office, just to clarify that. So did you get on the party ticket, uh, any party tickets or anything, or it was all self? Uh, 
No, um, uh, I ran as an individual. You know, I wasn't on any party then, but I was I was a green. I didn't run as a green though. Mm. Right, right. Uh, it, so if you were going to run again, what would you run for now um, at this stage? I, I'm, or I'm, how would you do it? Well, I had kind of a an overall plan to move up the ladder anyway, so I'm just kind of skipping over a couple of steps and going straight to the top. Now I'm going to, I'm, I'm running for Congress now. So, and I'm going to try to run as a green this time because I'm going to need all the help I can get, to be honest with you. <laughs> it's a big job. Which district are you in? Or, um, I am in district 17. In which Illinois. Runs from Iowa to, yes, yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. And where, where does it run from, um, District it, it, it goes from Galena to uh, Peoria to Gosberg to Kiwani to Moline, wow. that area there. It's the northwest right. corner of Illinois. So I, I tried to run as a Green, too. And so we should talk, because I'd want to run for Congress. I think sure. we should all try to run. Um, yeah, and what, what district are you in, ma'am? I'm in um, Quigley's district, I think. Um, six, or I think it's the six. Uh, mm -hmm. if, if they don't change all that, I, I heard they were they were going to gerrymander some more, but we'll yeah. see how that goes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Who else okay. has got a question? Uh, can you okay. hear me? Can you yeah. hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Jake That's is Jake, my name. Right. Uh, right I got a question. I got a question. I thought I thought we were hearing. I think we I thought we were hearing from the Green Party. You sound like you're uh, running with the Socialist Party. What's the difference? A lot of the Greens that I know are Socialist. I consider myself a progressive. I'm not exactly a capitalist, and I, I really don't like capitalism that much, but I'm trying to bridge the gap and kind of pull everything to the left towards the social side. And that's that's kind of my plan is, is to set things up to baby step the right and pull them left as much as we can. Mm. Yeah. One step at one step at a time. <laughs> yes, mm -hmm. go ahead. Go ahead. Who's next? I'll I'll throw one in. Is you know as a socialist I because I'm like you, I don't know. I'm progressive, green, whatever it is, left wing, and um, you know why is it so hard? I, I I think that that the Green Party and all of them are kind of being infiltrated and sabotaged by the right wing. You know, um, I did. Have you been involved with the Green Party? Uh, we had the head of the Green Party speak, and but then recently. Um, he just quit. He stepped down. Um, he had done pretty good. He was. He spoke here, and uh, you know, there somebody. They'll inf also the International Socialist Organization kind of got infiltrated, and then just you know, supposedly voted themselves out. You know, um, I think that's how the right wing is uh, taken over. <laughs> right, um. Okay. Uh... If, if you really look at the world stage, not just America, but the whole world stage, the Democrats are not left. They are still slightly to the right. And I think that's what Americans have trouble with is they think the Democrats are left. Very few Democrats are left. Sanders, AOC, a couple of others might be left, Warren, but right. barely. They're not socialists per se. And I think it's a misconception. The Green Party is basically the quintessential left party that we have. There is no other left party that I'm aware of. And I right. think that's what some of the difficulty is. But I, I, my hypothesis is that, I know when I was on there, that there's a, a kind of Israeli group is infiltrated, pro-Israeli, pro-war, pro-Zionist, has infiltrated. And they, they kind of sabotaged me on the ticket. Um, you know, and you're, what can you do? But I think at the local level, you don't even realize when you've been infiltrated as a party. 
and actually, I think the parties, we need them, but they have to be um, almost transparently uh, and ethically, you know, ethical about the way they, they put people in or, or stab them in the back <laughs> and get them blackballed. <laughs> You know, um, I, I, I haven't heard that, it, but I, I could believe it. Yeah. David, if it, you come up with an idea, I if you come up with said, an idea, let me know. Okay. I'm Who's sorry, next? say it again. Tim, Andrew yeah. Yang from, okay, Andrew go Yang ahead. from New York is uh, beginning a new political party. And Ross Perot tried it years ago. Who? And then we'll get Andrew you next. Yang of New York. Okay, so yeah, can I, 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 Guillermo, a um, little clearer, please. Yeah, uh, Andrew here. Yang, Yang from uh, New York. He's starting a new political party. Oh, I've heard that. Oh, is he? Yes. Oh, that's, that's, that's news to me. I haven't heard that one, but I'd be interested in seeing what he does. However, uh, maybe we could invite him to be a green. He seems like he would fit pretty well. Who, who oh, I got is a question. Did he know uh -huh. Anna's next. Go ahead, Anna. Unmute. Thanks. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say, Ellen, I, I think you're still a member, a Green Party member. I'm some of us here are Green Party members. Brad is, um, Charles is. Um, so I'm actually the paid state organizer for the Illinois Green Party. And um, we try to welcome as many people as possible. They can be uh, members if they believe in the 10 key values. Um, we do have a dues paying system if, if they can. Um, so um, we try to give everybody a fair shot at, um, you know, with politics, personality issues, and sometimes it's political too. Uh, like for example, like trans rights versus women's rights faction, you know, that is, you know, something that we're still, making sure that people are comfortable with talking about politics and it is what we can make of it. It is all hands on deck. It is um, the policy that comes through is what the people can, what we can do together. Um, I'm also running for uh, district. I was on here last time. Uh, I think it was the first virtual Zoom. Uh, and so when I was running for the 85th for state house, which I still am, campaigning never stops. Um, so um, with that, I submitted my endorsement for the West Suburban um, DSA group. Um, Howie Hawkins, when he was running, he was endorsed by several socialist groups, the, the Central DSA and the Green Party. So if we can, there's only so many progressives, there's only so much environmental voters out there. There's only so many informed people maybe in different aspects like Medicare for all so we're trying to put like policy over politics um this is not a zero-sum game we all need to act appropriately in order to help the future so it is not just this is not just um here's your vote and then you vote all the way down try to research the candidates and hopefully they can have we can provide Good candidates and not just a lesser of two evils. So thank you. I'm, I like Brad. Okay, <laughs> who's got the next question? All right, Charlie, go uh, ahead. Yeah, Brad, uh, good talk. Um, I have a question about your work when you want plan or method of employment. I was in charge of a public library. And we had them remain open for 60 hours per week. But if you had my staff could come and go whenever they wanted, how could I assure the public that the library would be open at any given time? Okay. Good question. Um, what if nobody actually, came in on Saturday? <laughs> Saturday yeah. morning, they all went out and got drunk. <laughs> I hear you. Uh, I meant to clarify that. Um, this seems like it would work well in like a small manufacturing setting, but I haven't really figured out services kind of businesses. You know, there's there's products and there's services, and I think the library might be a service, and I haven't really figured that part out yet. So I'm still working on that. 
it follow up even in small manufacturing if you have a line every, even well a, that, that line, depends on every you... person you can't you can't have gaps in the line like no 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 something like certain parts don't get put on or you can't do that no no i mean it wouldn't be <laughs> in like a factory where it was automated i'm thinking more like you know five guys working in a garage they turn into a workshop that's what i'm thinking where one guy pretty much builds the whole thing himself that sort of thing so i'm not entirely sure it would expand to something bigger than that or not but I, i'm just trying to come up with a new idea you know what i'm saying well i won't but i've been negotiating to call it alternate work schedules and I've been pioneering those for decades. And there's all kinds of variations. And the latest manifestation is work at home. But right, you have to right, identify right. what positions lend themselves to these flexible arrangements. So now I was a librarian and I was not eligible because librarians got to be in the library you know i basically a fireman's got to be in firehouse you know all right we've been on i just want to mean i have some experience in this regard thank you it's a right. good idea what what i'd like to see is more competition against walmart because i don't think any of us like walmart I, I i despise walmart with every fiber of my being I, I, I shop at Wal I shop at Walmart all the time. I'm sorry. Uh, don't do that anymore. It's up to me. I do it. I, I don't. I don't buy a whole lot. I do it because the the prices are lower than anybody any place else. Well, that's what they advertise, but that's not really true. Well, you you, you pick and choose. Yeah, I mean, same, same, I, I will shop same. at for the stuff. For the stuff that I need, I mean, the the, the things that I need that they don't have, but for the stuff that I need, their their, their products are much low, uh, tend to be lower in price than anywhere else. It's not it's not always the case, but it tends to be the case. Well, that, I'm, that's living on fixed, I'm living on I'm living I'm living on a fixed income. I, I get I'm I'm living right. on social social security and Medicaid. That's uh, and and uh, you know social security and, and and uh, Social Security and food stamps, basically. I hear you. I hear you. Uh, the thing is, the the Walmart thing's a double-edged sword, because the the cheaper that it is, you don't get cheaper for free. The cheaper it is, well, the true. less American that's workers true. there are. Right. Well, that's true. So, you pick I, mean, I, 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 I agree with you. They have a lot of Chinese-made products. They have products made right. from other parts our other parts of the world this is how it is i agree with you that we should be we should be right. buying more american products but sometimes you can't find them uh, uh my buddy my libertarian buddy that i was talking about his daughter wanted a new bicycle so i went yeah. to walmart and and i shit you not i looked at every box and it took me two hours not a single one was made in america not one Wow. If I want a bicycle, I only went. If I went, if I want a bicycle, I only go to Walmart to go to a bicycle shop. Right, right. That's that's the way we should do it. That's what I'm promoting here. I go. I go to Turns in Evanston, or I go to. There's another bicycle shop in the Edbrook area, which is closer to me. Yeah, I go to a bicycle shop. I, I wouldn't go bother going to Walmart. Right back. <clears throat> Um, okay. Can I oh, ask? Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's another yeah, question. Is how you know, um, like you talk about your libertarian friend, and I mean, mm -hmm. I as an analyst, I don't know what's the difference between him and you. You know, um, he's right wing, right? You're left wing. What? How? You know, could he run on the green? Could you run as a libertarian? I I don't know. I, you um, seem to understand the differences. <laughs> well, libertarians are kind of more authoritarian than we are, I think. 
And they're kind of a conspiracy nut jobs, too, to be honest with you. That's what he is. <laughs> kind of agree. We, but I, it's, it's so weird. How did the world get like this, do you think, in terms of, I mean, say, compared to 100 years ago? I don't know. Yeah, we're we're going to take over the world and leave you alone. <laughs> Yeah, uh, that, that's became, a good description. The, 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 the religious right made the world flat. Made the world <laughs> flat? <Yeah. laughs> flat. I'm kidding. I got, I got, a, I got a question for you. Um, well, how, how, how would you deal with the whole problem of climate change? Oh, um, actually, I kind of pictured this in my head a few years ago. I think it's kind of a cool idea. Is maybe if we had little electric trolleys instead of buses, you know, and would sweep by and pick up two or three people and automatically go to wherever they're going, I think that would help. Um, and I think we should localize power source. Like if you get a skyscraper, it should have its own windmill or something to, <laughs> on that order. There's there's a million different ways that we could generate power and nuclear is not the one we should be using. So I'd like to see a lot more localized power. And if the if, if one has trouble and goes down, it doesn't take the whole region out with it. What do you mean by trolley? <laughs> um, Light the, rail, come on. You know that. I mean, like, I mean, like, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, I'm asking him. I mean, like, light rail, is that what you mean? Um, more like horseless carriage. Uh, kind of, you, you, you've seen the Domino's commercial where they're using the little cars? Something in order of that. Oh. Okay. <laughs> oh, boy. I don't, I, I, I'm just throwing out an idea. I don't know. You, you can tell me it's crappy or whatever, but that's fine. <laughs> But I'm just throwing out some ideas. It's interesting, uh, right? Uh, is there ever been like an an economic, uh, like a more of a objective kind of analysis of the Green Party? It, I mean, you make me think that maybe the Greens and Lefts are subjective, and Libertarians are like objectivists in the Ayn Rand sense of the word, you know. Um, Right, and it's um, I, you would think ideally there'd be just like let's just do the right things, <laughs> you know. But I I'm not sure, you know. We used to talk about it in sociology class, but uh, you know this. I think somehow it's gotten now so extremist that all we do is attack the other side, um, you know. So that's what's kind of interesting about your kind of subjective ideas of. You know, how do you talk to a right winger? It, it's, you're very subjective, and I, um, but kind of like me, I'm like that. But maybe, you know, ideally we could develop a way to make your ideas a little more objective, so that uh, they sell better. I'm, I've got some market research background, and it's like you got to kind of test market what you say. <laughs> I'm not sure that right. trolley idea will work in a debate, you know. Um, okay. so, so, Brad, Brad, I have a question. Uh, so, yes, do sir. you support do you support the uh, Second Amendment and uh, Illinoisans' uh, uh, right to uh, you know concealed carry? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I have considered getting a gun several times myself. I've had somebody break in, and he straight up told me he was here to rape me. I wish I had a gun that day. You know, he was there saying? to what you? He was there to what? Rape yeah. you? Yeah, he was going to rape me. He he straight up said that to me. And I told him you better get out, or I'm going to pull a gun out. But I was bluffing. I didn't have a gun. Wow. What type of person so was I, it? I, um, yeah. Do you? Do you? I had you, don't know. Mm -hmm. who was you don't? Was he masked or I, I what? I don't know. Was he big? <laughs> no. He had he a gun? No. Mm -hmm. See, well, about two weeks before that, I broke my ankle, and it wasn't like I, could, I was going to fight with them. I couldn't fight with them. I, I knew that straight up. And he eventually left. We had a little talk, and I tried to tell him, you know, your mom ain't going to be proud of you and all that. 
and he actually sat down and listened to what I had to say. I was surprised. <laughs> but yeah, the thing is, he said, well, he was gay too. And he, he said, well, my boyfriend wouldn't like me here. And I'm like, I bet he wouldn't. <laughs> and three days later, three days later, he got arrested breaking into another place for the same reason. But that guy just knocked him down the steps. So wow. where do you I live you got in whatever. Chicago area or was this? In I, I live in Kiwani. Kiwani. I live in Kiwani, Illinois. Okay. Yes, that's yes, right. So a rural if I walk, situation. If I walk two, if I walk two minutes that way, I'm in the <laughs> cornfield. Okay. <laughs> wow. He lives. In, he lives near another good city, which is Peoria. Yeah, I'm about 45, 50 minutes from Peoria. So, Brad, out, out there in your area, you don't have a city police force. You have to call a, a county sheriff if you if you have a problem, or do you you're actually a Kiwani police department? Oh no, there, there is a police department. And they're say two, you no, know, about a mile down the road from me. Oh, okay, it's not a very big town. It's a, it's a rather small town. How's the uh, how's the uh, crack and uh, fentanyl epidemic out there? Is it reaching you guys? I imagine it is, but I really I'm not sure, honestly. But we do have a lot of drug problems around here, especially in the apartment that I live in. It, this is the ghetto in the middle of the cornfield, basically, is what it is. Speaking of uh, crack and fentanyl. Um, what do you think about the border crisis? Do, don't you think that in order for the United States to be a country, we have to have a, a secure border? Or do you agree with the, this open sieve of uh, the border we have, just allowing uh, have people from 150 countries pouring in? Looks like we're going to have 400,000 come in this month illegally. Car many of them carrying drugs and, uh, of course, diseases. There's been some diseases that are even... Uh, unheard of by some you know they don't even know what the people have by according according to some of the you know the handful that do get screened some of their symptoms they don't they have no idea even what they are okay oh, okay well there it is <laughs> so what do you think about the, the immigration crisis what's your position on that if you get elected to congress you might have to vote on this right <laughs> Right. <laughs> they're, they're, all, um, they're all bringing diseases. Do you, do you have sources on all these? Mm -hmm. I, I, I think they might be slightly exaggerated. Mm -hmm. But as far as immigration goes, we are all immigrants, every single one of us. So mm -hmm. put yourself in their shoes. Why, why are they coming here in the first place? So, so you're for open borders. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You're Why not? Open, yeah. I take that as a that you're for open borders. Then is that your position? What I'm asking you is what your position is, because as a representative, I would be representing the whole district. So first, I have to listen, right? The well, first thing my, I want to know uh, is what, what your well, position my, is. Well, my my position is that uh, that uh, security, you know, uh, you know, security starts at the border. So, uh, you know, I'm definitely for a secure border. I'm for uh, legal immigration, but not, not this illegal invasion that we have going on. No refugees. No uh, refugees. Bob, are you right wing, would you say? Would you say libertarian, Republican? What is your political party? Uh, yeah. I, would, I would say uh, libertarian, but, uh, but of course I would have to vote with uh, the Republicans, uh, you know, that's because that's, otherwise I'd be sort of wasting my vote. But uh, so I would tend to, you know, vote with, with the Republican party. I wouldn't vote libertarian just to try to, uh, you know, make right. a statement or something. There's too oh. much on the line here. We've, we're, we're our, you know, we're, we're losing uh, everything America was built upon, you know, to this, to this new uh, radical left wokeism. And that has to be stopped, in, in my opinion. What, so, what are your so, sources, Bob? I mean, you wait, really wait, 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 do me, sound, you know, like a right wing. Whatever happened to 
what, what whatever happened to bring us your downtrodden and your tired and all that mm -hmm. like on the statue of liberty where'd that go to well right. those those that's when we when we were growing in the you know sort of in the industrial revolution and we needed all these uh you know third world peasants mm -hmm. uh, you know to to work here now uh you know in the new you know in the new age with terrorism with pandemics with you know cr you know crime everything like it is uh i think we need to uh pull it in a bit and go you know we have to definitely have to have legal channels of immigration and not just open borders okay. to anybody that can you know we have no idea who's coming in what their criminal backgrounds are uh, or anything like that if they're diseased if they're terrorists, if they mean harm to us, you know, no, there's, there, like I said, there's, okay. well, there's nothing. Uh, let me, <laughs> let me ask you, let, let me ask you a question. Okay. What percentage of people do you think that would qualify? I mean, I mean given a hundred immigrants, what percentage of that hundred immigrants would you think would be a terrorist? Um, Geez, I I don't know if one percent of them are a terrorist. That's 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 one percent too many. But I'm sure it's probably not even one percent. It's probably probably far less than that. But the thing is, you know, you know, you have no idea uh, what's coming in. It only took eleven people to do uh, the World Trade Center bombs. You know, right. <laughs> right, I agree. I agree. That was um, an inside job, that right? What if that was an inside job? Would that change your mind? Of course, it's not an inside job. We have it all. Everything's we have it all. It's all documented. These guys went to these training schools. Training, you know, yeah, you know, but but who paid them? They, training and you know, and the right way. It, 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 it wasn't. It was an inside job in the sense that we had been arming the terrorists for decades. We were we were actually arming the Mujahideen before it became before it became the the uh, Al Qaeda. Yeah, right. and that, that's, and that's right. quite a stretch. Yeah, to say Rumsfeld. That nine eleven was an inside inside job. I mean, you know, Rumsfeld, Nixon, they're the ones that that built Brzezinski, Kissinger, the right wing, you know, global deep state are the ones that created. You know Saddam Hussein and and they, the Mujahideen and they were, we, they we were go our, around uh, militarizing all, right, all, right, let's, all let's, those guys. We can and get that it. created the this walls and <clears throat> um, the libertarian. I mean that's the problem. Is okay, guys, we're starting to lose our our focus. Well, no, oh, I got a question. Got go a ahead, question. Charlie. Yeah, Brad. I got a loony neighbor who has a stockpile of weapons. And he thinks he's, according to the Constitution, he's authorized to be enforce the laws to the United States. And he poses a threat to everybody in the neighborhood. I don't even want to go out in my backyard at night. And he's saying, I hate this. This is what you think is okay with you? That some loony guy has a stockpile of weapons? And and some loony way of thinking. I wouldn't even call it thinking. It's like non-thinking. Bob Matter. <laughs> so you, <laughs> so I I just have to accept this and like fear for my life. If I go out, my cat escapes once in a while at night, and I want to go out and catch him, but this guy might shoot me. You think I'm a intruder? Uh, okay well let's start here um do you think that we should have uh, different kinds of iq tests or something like that for gun control no test at all no guns no guns no none of this thing oh i like that if somebody gets training it's okay for them to have a gun like suddenly you've inculcated them with an intellect. I mean, this guy's loony. And there's more of them out the, there. The problem, the problem I see is we cannot uninvent the gun. 
There's no way to uninvent it. It's already been invented. So we have to deal with it as it exists, right? That's the starting point. The, the government has plenty of experience regulating things. Man, are you for real? So the government is incapable of regulating anything? Nothing? I would I would hope they can. I would like to see I mean, us do that. I mean so we could regulate there's, there's, there's you can't of... regulate guys from selling snake oil and telling you that it's <laughs> medicine. Some guy puts some stuff in a bottle and puts a label on it. We can't regulate. We can't stop him, preclude him. I mean, we're talking lethal weapons. Uh, here, I'll give you another case. This is a serious issue. I'm a union representative. You want everyone to have guns, concealed guns. A guy who was in one of my colleagues in Indiana they went to the union meetings. We go to these all the time. The employee is getting fired. And he's representing the employee. Five, five, three managers and union guy. And the and the employee says, Well, I don't, I'll show you assholes. He pulled out a gun. He started plugging away. We can't even conduct our normal what relations in the workplace. Who can be a union official? If you got guns, guns, uh, concealed guns. Well, if you had a gun, you wouldn't have been able to do anything. You'd have plugged him first. Oh, come on, be serious. <laughs> I can't go to, I can't go to a meeting. You know, the people are disgruntled. They yeah. get fired. They're getting disciplined. <laughs> Man. You just hey, sure. I am accept this. I just like, I mean, can't stop this. Armed guards, Charlie, outside the meeting room when they take away your weapons before you go in. They Isn't do it? that. Yeah. As a matter of fact, they do that all the time. Yeah. Yeah. When somebody gets yeah. fired, they send two yeah. security people. That yeah. you think yeah. I'm kidding you, man? They've done that yeah. for years. I've yeah. gone yeah. with them. <coughs> they well, sent two it, security it, guards, and I go there well, to represent the employee. And they say that, right. that's it when they affect the termination. Yeah. And this yeah. is the world. I, this is yeah. the world. I, I, just I, yeah. Yeah. I, I got. I got a question for you. Is this this guy in a live in a house or an apartment? A house. My lonely right? neighbor. Oh. Yeah, your goofy neighbor. <laughs> Uncle Brad, uh, right? Are you asking no. Uncle Brad? No, I'm asking. I'm asking. I'm asking. I'm asking Charlie. Is, is this guy live in a house or an apartment? House. Oh, 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 so he owns. Oh, oh, so he owns the house. All right. What? Oh. Okay. We're getting off the subject, but yeah, yeah. Okay. Really, really so okay. he can endanger right. my life, our lives because he bought a house. Oh. Okay, yeah, so he owns it. Okay. You can't All go right. Home. Yeah, that camp complicates it. If you're in an apartment, you can have him evicted, but if he owns the house, you can't have him evicted. Okay. Well, anyway, um okay, Brad, what why uh what soured you to capitalism? Well, I've lived it. I've, I've worked at McDonald's in three different cities. Couldn't make it work in any of them. Um, I was told, uh, get good grades, graduate college, and all that blah, blah, blah bullshit, you know. Now i got a, a, a $30,000 scrap of paper. It's not worth anything. Nobody cares about it, you know. And it's not really capitalism itself. It's corporatism. And I try to separate the two. Because corporatism is where we get the, three, the CEO that has 350 times as much money. And if you look on a chart, the first 80% of that chart represents 80% of Americans, right? And they only have 7% of the, of the resources. And if you get to the last 1%, he's four times taller than the chart. So something's got to change. Or America's just going to disappear. That's my opinion. Yeah. 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 What, you know, what is it? What, what I was going to say, we really, 
really don't have really don't have uh we really don't have capitalism. What we have is the best democracy money can buy. <laughs> have a have a have a uh, an election system that's bought and sold to the highest bidder. That's the real problem, I think. I absolutely agree. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. And I have a I do have a, a policy, but I won't say it out loud in front of millions of people. But I will say it to you guys because I like you guys. But mm-hmm. if I were to be elected. And I see somebody taking a bribe. I'm going to throw up punch him, and I'll take the two days in jail for it. I don't care. <laughs> right. Is there used to be a law that bribes? There still are the um, honest services laws were in place um, for everything but a bribe. But it, what you realize is actually bribes are illegal still they threw out a lot of those with the enron decision they they the corrupt supreme court made it okay to be corrupt for prosecutors in every way except bribes Uh, because it'd be too hard on the prosecutors to make a case or something it's so corrupt but uh the form of corruption you know bribery i mean what they have to catch you handing money to somebody I mean, the, the system is all bribery. You know, you pay me to get on the ticket and I will, uh, you know, and then I'll vote, you know, for whatever war and poison and vaccine you want, you know, um, right? I mean, the whole system is bribery, right? I mean, I, that's, that's well, what well, is well, here. You know, unless we restore well, the regulations that make it illegal and they enforce the, you know, put in, campaign finance laws back and all the regulations back, right? But it's, uh, but yeah, or sock them in the face if you see it. <laughs> well, Alan, but, look, uh, at, yeah. uh, look at Hillary Clinton, uh, you know, giving speeches to the financial groups for $275,000 uh, a shot. That's That was just bribery. They just call it a speech. Yeah. A speech right. or- oh. All four parties are basically bribery. Just like right now, Hunter Hunter Biden is selling. All of a sudden, Hunter Biden, who's been a crackhead for 50 years, now he's turned into a celebrated artist (laughs) selling his paintings for $500,000 a piece. And of course, that's nothing but a bribe to the, you know, that's his influence peddling to reach his dad. And this it's it's, it's legal. You can call it. Well, yeah, people are buying his art. If it's good, it was it was good. If it's good art, why? If it's good art, why not? Well, it's not good art. It's it's crap. But it's just like it's just a it's just a you know it's just a vehicle for <laughs> money laundering. Bribery. Yeah, exactly. It's money laundering. It's just bri- It's bribery. That's it. It's just that's it. Plain. Yeah. Our, 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 whole, our whole our whole election system is a form of legalized bribery. I mean, our campaign finance system, I should say. Yeah. And that, yeah, that's absolutely. what we got to restore. Even, you know, McCain Feingold, it started with that. You know, um, they just need to put right. it back the way it was before everything got deregulated. You know, because it, why, why, you know, it sounded kind of good at the time. Reagan will deregulate everything, but they deregulated everything, <laughs> mainly every regulation that would have gotten in their way, you know, no matter who you are, the the incumbent always wins. It's like a casino, right? They're going to always stay in office forever because, you know, they got all the money, all the telephone, all the airtime, all the lobbyists, all the, you know, no, that's why it is impressive that you say you got a little bit of press or somebody saying that you got some good press. It's because you're you sound you're sound on the issues, whereas you know if you look, doesn't matter if it's MSNBC on the left or Fox News on the right. They um, it, right now it's you know I think that's how they pick the guns and they pick the abortion, you know, and the and the vaccine to get us all divided, you know, and so no matter what you say, and you could have facts and everything. You get sabotaged, you know, just attacked. If you say, like, I think this vaccine is poison, and all of a sudden, you know, every socialist in the world is biting my head off. And it's really weird because I'm like, wow. And then, you know, 
and then guns. Everything. Ellen, Ellen. They figure this out. People are they, divided. This is, this people is are not the, People right? are not divided. You're a researcher. People are not divided on the vaccine. It's down to 10%. No. Don't get vaccinated. No, it's That's the red all. states versus the Only blue states. Only 10%. You go, to, you go to Georgia, Texas, Florida, yes. you know, all those governors. And Rand Paul, well, they're going to run for president. We check out our employees and you know, only 10%. That's hardly right. dividing the country. That's your, you know, who's the survey? Who are your employees? You Ellen, know, federal government. They're not even allowed to say they're not for it. You know? We have a nationwide, nationwide workforce. This, these polls, you know, I'm a poll person. Kelly Ann Conway the got in there by being a lion pollster. You can As make a, a poll fact, say whatever you want, Charlie, the, and you know it. The employees said they will not go someplace if people are not vaccinated. Right. Anyway. Well, that's the vision. Okay, guys, let's, like let's, get back. Let's, let's get back. Let's get back. Let's get Charlie. Please Ellen. don't take poison vaccine to keep our job. Right. That's if the not the vision. Poison, if we knew that the vaccine was poison, do you what do you think would happen if there's some way to actually get the information to 100% of the people? This thing is poison. Oh, no, it's I think not. They would probably lynch what you it, what every makes it poison? It what makes it poison? Jeez, what makes it poison? Because it's, it's got AIDS in it. They manufacture it with AIDS virus in it. It's not even a virus. If they not manufacture this thing to infiltrate your nervous system and kill you. It's called no, depopulation it control. They are they want to kill, just like Prince Charles and the Crown no, said they want to I kill off every yeah. all but the, the highest one. They want to yeah, kill yeah, off yeah, the poor yeah. people, the brown people, the all black right, people. Guys, we're, we're, getting yeah. getting off, we're getting off yeah. subject here, okay? Well, no, it's not. Brad, what do you what do you it's, think it's, about it's, all this? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, if it's going to kill everybody, can we just treat it over to D.C. and be done with it then? What do you mean, uh, what do you mean be done with it? Uh, uh, the vaccine, if it's going to kill, kill everybody, can we shoot all the congressmen with it and kill them all? Or I'm just yeah. kidding. I'm just I kidding. Know, they're going to kill. <laughs> it's like Hunger Games. Look at Hunger Games and see how it ends, right? That there all these people are just dying up. Oh, it's cancer. Oh, it's AIDS. Oh, it's, you know, Ebola. Oh, it's this. Couldn't be any, okay. do anything well, about it. You know, oh, oh boy, the virus came. And if you look at 1865, watch the movie Jezebel. You see it's states rights in, in New Orleans where they were, they had the yellow fever, yellow jack, which meant the rich people go off. And if the poor people try to get over there, they shoot them. They, they go, they sent all the people with the, with the virus off to the leper camps, basically. Ellen, and that's Ellen, what they do in states. People, this is a Ellen, great way. It's like a part of Millions of people have gotten the vaccine. Millions have gotten the vaccine. Listen to and this. They're getting right. Right. They get the second one. They have no. not died. The all the no, people, in Israel, everybody dying all in Israel the people right are now getting has got boosters. a vaccine. They're Look at the dead. statistics of Israel. Okay, that's here's the article. Okay, okay. Ellen, Ellen, years, Ellen, Ellen, Ellen. All right, off. Bob Minder has another example. question for our speaker. Who gets a booster shot if it killed you? All right, all right. <laughs> Bob, hey, bro, go ahead. Like you, you have to wait like we, um, Charlie, <laughs> shut up. Well, since we stumbled <laughs> on this hot topic of COVID, I have They're to ask dead. Brad. I have to ask Brad if he favors these these vaccine mandates and also masking of children, which uh, apparently is medically unnecessary. If you look at many European countries, they don't mask their children. But so anyway, let's get your, uh, let's get Brad's opinion on that. Um, last I checked, uh, a mask has never killed anybody. Millions and millions of surgeries go down every year and nobody's ever died from a mask. So they do work. As far as the vaccine, so oh, you're you're I for masking mandates as well. Yes, but okay, man, what about the, what about vaccine mandates? As far as the vaccine, I can't see forcing somebody to take something against their will. That seems a little barbaric to me. Thank you. But if it protects well, I have to go to work with disease. Never people. before has it been done, you know, until now. And 
And anybody who says anything about it yeah, gets so, thrown off the so. internet, deplatformed. Uh, That's well, why nobody knows it. Free speech. Our employees down, don't want to go to work. Down. Employees don't want to go to work with unvaccinated people who Charlie, don't wear masks. The, the, that is not a vaccine, and nobody is getting the truth hey, about it. But the smartest the people are telling you, but they're off. You have to go to bit shoot. Go look at Rockfin, look at Whitney Webb, look at, I went to at my Jason Vermas, all the smartest people. And look at, you know, um, Kevin Barrett. You know, the world is saying in, in India, go, you know, give us treatment. All the, you know, libertarians and Republicans are saying, why can't we just get treatment? Ivermectin, hydrochloroquine, anything. We don't have to take a vaccine. But they go, no, you're not allowed to. This It's misinformation yeah, why don't you is take coming from the top, coming the from Charlie. Charlie works for the FBI, and they have to enforce it, just like <laughs> the military. We are giving <laughs> everybody <laughs> this vaccine, and we're going to kill them off because they Would told you us to. A vaccine authoritarianism. For our first down, vaccine down, mandate down. was in 1809 for smallpox, you know. Yes, exactly, exactly. We, we've been, second, we've been second, and, <laughs> right, right. and after after the polio vaccine came out, I I, I believe there was a uh, there was a vaccine mandate there too. Right. Well, yeah, but if it was a real vaccine, this is a this is genetic engineering that gets uh, into your system, Ellen, right? If you, it if goes you in want... there and makes a little spike on the protein, go into your system, it collects in your ovaries so that you will not be able to have children. I don't, uh, pregnant will not be able to have children. Where, so where, where, where are you, where are you, where are you hearing this? Where, 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 where are you, where, where, where are you hearing this from? I've read it. I've got mountains of information on it. Yeah. Where, 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 where from the, where, where from the, from the Larushi files or what? <laughs> no. Probably I bet you. From the scientific <laughs> literature, okay? <laughs> All really? <of> science. <laughs> Truth 11, Robert Kennedy, but he's not allowed to be on there. Every, these are, this is about? mostly you know for random. All right, Brad, Brad wants to say to something. The Tea Party, they're not allowed uh, to be on there. <laughs> And it's the complete re left wing, Steve right Brady. wing. This Where is how the right Brad, wing wants uh, to win the election. Stick right? around. This, this is how they did better. it. <laughs> hey, I'm, I'm having some fun. I don't know about uh, how you that. Guys. That's great. That's great. <laughs> best book is Rock Mercola. Okay, look at Mercola. Still dead he's dead wrong, got, he's the best one. Cynthia McKinney, the head of the Green Party, writes about it. Okay, she ran for office. She's but she can't. She's been thrown off of Twitter and everything. You know, nobody who mentions the V word and never before. If you mention, post a scientific article on this. Like this guy was Yardley, Michael Yardley. He was the head of R and D at Pfizer. He says one thing about this is. T cells are how what kills a virus, not an antibody, all not right, just a Jim, B cell. I don't okay, but he gets all thrown. Right, I got thrown off of All right, Judge uh, 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 Ellen. Ellen. Misinformation. Ellen, we got okay, maybe, information. Maybe, maybe. Okay, yeah, this I'm, is I'm, 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 Talk okay. about the vaccine, and then we can. Oh, right. the yeah, yeah. yeah, look at Robert yeah. McCullough. Yeah. There's lots of doctors. Uh, Doctor McCar Mercola, right? That's he's all right, the one. Ellen, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna stop the debate on this topic, okay? Or the whatever. Brad, what besides your um agenda on uh the truth oh. about God? Okay. Uh, uh, Cynthia Ellen, we'll, Ellen will, you, will you? We're gonna. We're, we're trying to uh, get back on track, okay? Um, and we'll we'll be we'll be more than happy to let you have your time during the rebuttal period, okay? Brad, on other issues besides what you had mentioned, what are your stances? Say, for example, on climate change, perhaps nuclear power, perhaps maybe some of the uh, issues that are running in in, in central Illinois, like uh, you know ethanol production and. Uh, what do you think about like agricultural subsidies, things like that? Uh, um, anything that we could do to protect the environment, I'm definitely for it. Uh, as far as Ellen goes, um, don't fall into the, the logical fallacy of comparing 
equalizing one opinion at 99, just saying. I'm just testing hypotheses, okay? COVID operation. Yes. Play, okay, and Ellen, Charlie Ellen, would not let again. me give a talk on this, okay? I, a year and a half later, I, I, he won't let me talk. If you're not allowed to talk, you just keep collecting more and more information. I'll all debate right? you, you Ellen, when you're ready. Somebody will see it, when, right? That's okay. all you want. We'll Somebody that's when you're ready. This, right? All these sources, scientific. <laughs> I'll debate you, Ellen, sometime soon. She'll, she'll be all right. She'll be all no, right. I know, I know. All right, so, Brad, um, you <clears> see <throat> <this>, um, <throat> You're running for the Green Party. Uh, what do you think your first day in office will be like should you get elected? I'll be honest with you, I never thought about it. <laughs> um, but uh, I, I'll have plenty of cold beer and invite all you guys. Well, the thing is, you know, you're going to have to get a staff set up. You're going to have to, you know, address constituencies. You're going to be flying back and forth to Washington quite a bit to make sure to keep the schedule going. I don't know, have you ever right. talked Actually, to I was I was planning on uh, just moving to DC. Probably be easier than flying back and forth. Yeah, but your constituents will want you in, in, in district too quite a bit. Talk to them. You know. Right. A lot, of, a lot of congressmen use the overnight train out of DC on Thursday or Friday nights and come back to their constituencies refreshed after a train journey. On Amtrak. Is that right? That. That sounds like a, a good plan, actually. Yeah. Um, Just a second. My, my phone's dying, so give me a sec here. Okay. Okay, God. Okay, Brad. We'll, we'll let you go. Um, uh, Anna, what do you think of all this? Do you think, um, what does it take to run for political office? If you're there, Anna. Or Charlie. Still with us? I, th I think she is. She might just be listening. Um. <laughs> I'll open it up to Charlie and, and Brad. What do you think it constitutes a good political candidate? Someone who's who actually does what he says he's going to do. That's the first and foremost thing. Okay. And uh, oh, kitty cat. <laughs> Sorry, my cat you ran. attacked me. Don't what worry. percentage of the vote did you get? I mean, you have you could do a poll and find out, you know, um, whether, you know, what percent would vote. It's it, you you don't realize how impossible it is, you know. Mr. Smith, could he get to Washington? You know, um, I think you know. I it, we need to take the money out. Why not? You know, um, but how do you get them to vote on that? You know. Um, so that there would be public financed elections, right? That uh, that you, but as it is, people will just tell you, no way, can't can't be done. You gotta have money, you know. You gotta compromise. You gotta right. sell your soul. Like, you know, actually, do what AOC did. Vote for Israel. You know, Israel forever war. That's why she was crying the other day. Did you Charlie know? log off? Oh, here he comes back. Okay. Right. Actually, actually, I do have an answer to that. Go ahead. Let's hear it. I plan on using what's called guerrilla marketing, if you know what that means. Yes, I know what it it's, means. It's cheap. It's cheap. It's effective. Everybody talks about it for weeks afterwards. So that was my angle. Since I, I don't have a lot of money, so I have to do something a little wild, you know. What would you do, guerrilla? What, what, how would that apply to your campaign? Right. Um, I mean, I bounced, I bounced this off of my cousin when we talked about it. And what I was doing was I, I'm building a six foot tall dollar sign in a huge ball and chain. And I was going to dress like Uncle Sam and kind of slung around town. Like the money is crushing the government. That's kind of the message I was going to send. And I think that would get a lot of attention really, really quick. <clears throat> How many votes would it take? How many votes? How many would it take to get on the ballot in just in your area? Do you know how many um, signatures? If I'm not mistaken, five thousand, which so is going to take a little bit to do, but 
and you only have three months to do it, right? Or um, between like, is it September and next year that you have to do it to get on the ballot? That was, I think you only have like three months at a certain period of time to go out and they can't be on the ballot in another county or for another person. No. So it, it gets, Dip, it's impossible to get on the ballot practically. I've found. Well, I, I don't think it'd be impossible. I do the impossible all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, like, for example, uh, you can't build an Optimus Prime replica 15 feet tall, but I did that too. I, I, I like to prove people wrong. That's what I do best. Mm -hmm. If you say it's impossible, that's a challenge to me. Right, right. I'm asking really, I, when do you have to get the signatures? I, it's next year that we vote for Congress, right? Not this November, right. but right. but a year, year from yeah. now, between September and November, you have to get 5,000 signatures. <laughs> and that, it should right. be impossible, but uh, it you do have to organize, you know? Um, right, I, ha I have people come up in the bar <laughs> all the time just to toast me and say, hey, you know, if you ever run for anything again, I'm behind you. And that happens constantly. So I got a lot of people in q that are already going to vote for me. That's good. And some of them are Republicans, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I I think everybody, we just want to... All right, Ellen, it. Ellen, Ellen, let's move on. Does anybody else have any more questions real quick? Yeah, I, I do. Go, go ahead, Charlie. Yes, this uh, made in the USA policy, I'm not certain... How do you plan specifically? Now the capitalists have moved the production facilities around the world until they have settled in Asia where they can engage in exploitation without encumbrance. And I'm not certain, I'm a union organizer, and I'm certainly in favor of indigenous industry, which can be done according to, uh, well, basically it's done by adults in the United States, unlike Asia, where a lot of it is done by children. But at least in, in, what I'm saying is, um, we have certain standards for the conditions of employment. And how do we get the capitalist class? Do you want to put some sort of trade barrier in place uh, to preclude people from shopping at big box retailers who specialize in selling this this type of merchandise. Well, Charlie, you gotta you gotta remember something else too. People are choosing to shop at big box stores. That's why they're successful. Well, I did have an idea. Well, that 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 makes ahead, no sense. Go ahead, go ahead. You know, go ahead. Everything anything goes. What what are you talking about? You have a society that what there's no there's no, 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 no the market you, you don't understand the market the market is driving it okay brad what do you so think we're victim to the market we worship the no i'm saying i'm saying that's why they're successful is because the market is driving it well then how do we control the market you, you go buy a place where you want to support that's how you that's how you make change if enough people start as not right. shopping at walmart they'd go out of business so I got to buy a factory and a big box retailer? No, you just start shopping somewhere else. What solution is that? A lot of people will do it, and uh, it's called competition. That's why corporations, uh, you, you hurt them more when you try to uh, discredit them mm -hmm. than you would if you uh, tried to, uh, you know, take them to court. Trust me. L uh, let, let, let me run an idea. I shouldn't guy. discredit them? Okay, okay. Go ahead, I Brad. shouldn't discredit somebody? Who puts children to work? <coughs> yeah, Anna, Let me run another question there. Yeah. Okay, okay, Brad, and then we'll go to Anna for a question. Okay, Brad. Okay, go ahead. so what if we said something like on every Sunday, 
you pay zero sales tax on any product made in USA. How about that? <clears throat> Would give these some Americans some incentives to buy. I know that. Oh, that's that's exactly right. I think hey, every Sunday. Work. You're saying every Sunday. Every fourth. Yeah, Sunday. E yeah. E every Sunday, every Sunday, zero percent sales tax on American products. Just oh, okay. So another, 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 another. The rest of the week to be sales tax. But Sunday, Sunday, no sales tax on American-made products. Okay, that right. might work. All right, Anna, Sounds what if like you have a question idea. on your hand? Go ahead. Uh, if you want to talk here, ask your question, please do so. Um, yeah, I just wanted to comment on the uh, signature requirements. Right here. So it is 90 days. Um, it ends July 15th of next year for the non-established parties. It starts April 13th, um, some, sometime in mid-April. Um, and yeah, he would need 5,000 minimum, 10,000 maximum. Um, so the Greens, once again, will be doing our 50,000 signatures for uh, the statewide races. And so we will be uh, canvassing uh, two petitions, you know, one for the statewide and then one for um, our, our recognized candidates. So we'll be all hands on deck if anybody wants to join. Anna, how much if, is the filing fee for statewide? I don't believe that there is a filing fee in the state of Illinois for our our candidates, but I think I could be wrong too. So I'm not. I don't think that there is any, but I could be wrong. It's between April and July of next year okay. that you yeah. get on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's all kind of uh, different right now because of the re redistricting numbers were delayed. And um, right now they're just started the hearings on the 8th for the congressional district. So uh, the map's not even out for Brad yet, um, but uh, it's not stopping us. Word on, the street is the, Good word, to know. word on the street is that the Democrats are really going after suppression of third party candidates because they're they're terrified of the midterms, uh, the probably the, probably the coming slaughter that's going to happen. So uh, be well, prepared that's for that's uh, be prepared for do. lots of signature challenges and things like that. Yeah, last year we got COVID relief. We worked with the Libertarian Party, and we got a judge's order. Um, from what I've heard, uh, they even agreed to that, and then they still trying to appeal appeal that decision and um, the case was affirmed on the appellate level. But uh, yeah, they even went back to, to say no COVID relief, of all signature requirements, which are already way higher than the established parties and then notary, notary requirement all during fresh in the beginning of COVID. So, you know, we paid uh, tax paying monies for that. Uh, um, for them to try to throw us off the ballot. That's typical. We're prepared. Yeah, pretty hypocritical of the Democrats who are, you hear them constantly whining against the Republicans about voter suppression. They're the biggest voter suppressors that ever existed. That's, that's, yeah, not, we that's, had not, a... voter, that's not voter suppression that's, throwing, that's forcing someone off the ballot. ballot. And they do it, both, they do it both directions. <laughs> Um, are there any other questions for Brad right now? Brad, I used to. Are there any more questions for Brad? Let's go to rebuttals, man. Okay, rebuttals it is. Let's say a speaker. Uh, thank you, Brad, for uh, speaking tonight. I hope you uh, found it enjoyable. <laughs> yeah, I had I had a blast actually. Oh, good. Well, you'll get the last word in all this stuff. So who's going to wants to do the first rebuttal? Bob, we'll leave that uh, choice to you since you're probably ready with a speech right away. If you're ready to go. Oh, no, actually, I, I don't have anything, actually. Not, at least not at the moment. Okay, well, let's, uh, who wants to go first? All right, uh, Charlie, why don't you go first on, uh, on well, the I'm not quite ready yet. Uh, I haven't even written down my thoughts. <laughs> Guillermo? Mm -hmm. No, that's okay. All right. Well, I guess I'm going to do the first rebuttal then. 
I have been listening to a lot of green candidates recently over the few last few months. And I know that there's a lot out there that you guys stand for, but you know, the one thing that the socialist tendencies forget is that capitalism is based on incentives, you know, incentives to work, incentives to make money. And I think one of the hardest jobs in the capitalist system is being a small businessman because you not only got to watch your prices and parts and keep your consumers happy, but you also have to keep your employers happy and uh, you pay your taxes. And it's probably one of the most significant challenging positions around. I've seen many a person, uh, you know, literally when you run a business, it takes up your entire life. And yep, yep, yep. And, you know, when it comes to workers pay, a lot of a lot of people I know, at least in the smaller companies, will do the, what they have to do to keep a good worker on board. And the thing is, you know, if you're running a manufacturing plant, for example, you need a certain amount of staffing to keep the machines running. You want them there on time. You want them to take off off time. You want people to show up reliably. You know, and yes, you do have some of the other things that, uh, from what my understanding is, most small businesses right now are valuing things like human capital which basically means that, uh, you know, this is the first time in many, many, many years that we've seen uh, corporations wanting workers. And it's a, it's a good thing that it's starting to happen. Um, I know a lot of people will be saying that, uh, you know, in there. My thing is I'm a, still a Republican. I still like limited government. I still like less deregulation. I still like open borders and markets. But I do realize that you know, if the power is in the hand invested in the corporations who always want to get special favors from the government, uh, that's where we uh, part ways as being a capitalist versus what we what Adam Smith called the mercantilist. Adam Smith railed against uh, corporate interests a lot of times. He railed against uh, monopolies. And he railed against a lot of the things because at the time that Adam Smith was around in 1776, when he wrote his book, the East India Tea Company was the largest corporation in the world. They had private armies. They had they were almost like a government in the areas they controlled from the British Commonwealth. And he rallied against it because, you know, that just stifled competition and it just wouldn't let the best people come forward. I think the one industry where we see capitalism thriving is in two. One in Illinois is these new uh, cannabis stores that have opened up recently. And they've been, you know, some of the people, I know some money behind them, but, you know, they're really going all out to start the marketing programs, the Facebook pages, and to get people to come in and all that kind of thing. And the other one is in the consumer electronics industry where we've seen dramatic price differences and, in, in, in the you know, uh, increasing involvement with technology and yet a cheaper pricing overall. Now, I know it's a worldwide field, but, you know, you have to admit, uh, when you first bought a plasma TV 15 years ago, it'd be five grand. Now you can get a good LED TV for under 200 bucks. That's where capitalism works. I uh, could close out with the video, but I've shown it before. It's where Elmer Fudd talks about our capitalist system. It's an idealized version, yes, but uh, I think it's the way to go. You know, you invest, you do it. And like I said, sometimes uh, these corporatists need to uh, have their wings clipped and it's called the antitrust laws. Right now, you know, even, even today, who would have heard of Facebook 20 years ago? Who would have heard of Google 20 years ago? Who would have heard of uh, some of these other tech, big tech companies in less than 15 years? Who would have known that Amazon would have gotten so big? Well, the reason is, is that for the most part, they invested their capital wisely, they moved on and they had products that people wanted. And the thing is, you know, when in, in, in there a capitalist system, you have a vote, it's called your dollar, you can go where you want to go and buy what you want to go. You don't like Walmart, you don't have to go there. Yeah, you might be paying a little bit more for pricing. But if you want a small business, go and support them. You like, uh, you like the little shops that are on the corner, go and support them. Um, or like what I do, I like a place called Gambino's Market in uh, Schiller Park. I support them. I like uh, the Walgreens. And there's another small restaurant up here. It's called uh, it's called Chubby's. And it's a nice restaurant. It's a hot dog stand. But I support them. Uh, you know, 
every dollar I, I spend means I support them. Right now, a tenth of my income is going to these guys, but I reluctantly support them because I like the cigarette <laughs> brand. But at the same time, I know I got to quit, you know. Um, but uh, capitalism works, socialism doesn't. And I think you guys are way off on climate change because I honestly think that it's going to be the only real way you're going to replace fossil fuels with some kind of nuclear energy. I'm it's not, not going to happen. It's not well, going to happen. Well, you know, um, uh, you'd be surprised. Anyway, I don't want to go on much further, but okay. um, I do believe that uh, we're in for a good future. Um, look at a site called humanprogress.org. It uh, does a lot of the more positive things that have happened in the last 20 years. And I think you'd be absolutely shocked by how much good has actually happened in the last 20 years. Because if you look at, if you just look at Fox News or your little liberal press and the woke culture, you know, it, you're just going to wind up hating everybody and everything because that's all they're selling is hate is the division of this on the other side. And uh, you got to really start looking, you know, um, and that that's all I have to say. So thank you very much. Who's next for the rebuttal? Bob, you ready? Or is Jake, Jake you want to go? Yeah, for a yeah, I guess I'll go. Um, okay, um, Bob. So yeah, a couple, couple questions I would have asked, uh, Brad, if I would have thought about it in time, uh, I would have asked about the what he thinks about the the budget deficit in this current fight for passing this humongous uh, bill, this big socialist uh, spending bill that bill that Biden wants, and also I was, uh, was going to ask him about uh, what he thinks about uh, transgender uh, girls, which are biological males competing in women's sports as well. But uh, anyway, um, kind of uh, uh, along the same lines of uh, as Tim, uh, you know, the Green Party is essentially, you know, another, just another socialist party like the Democrats. I mean, it's a, it's a, a collective, uh, it's redistribution of wealth, um, more government, you know, more taxing, more spending, you know, more giving away. And um, I think, you know, no, none of these, uh, none of these uh, liberal candidates seem to have an understanding of how economics works. And like, and like, and like the reason why CEOs make so much money and why, why these, you know, why these, you know, they, they always have this hatred of these successful corporations well these corporations are successful because they're satisfying uh you know desires in the marketplace they're doing a good job at it that's that's it uh you know there's no other no other reason uh for it and the, CEOs, on that? the ceos no other reason the ceos are are uh, helping me, you know, they're the ones at the helm of these companies, uh, you know, navigating through through all the, uh, you know, various obstacles out there to increase those shareholder values, to, to get the, you know, to make sure these companies are satisfying market needs and making money. I mean, they're, they get paid that much because they're, they're worth it. Uh, that's, that's just, you know, as simple as that. Now, sometimes, uh, hey, when they're not when they're not producing, then uh, then they get replaced. Um, you know, pretty much that uh, that easy. And uh, we also didn't get to get to ask uh, uh, Brad about uh, his reflection on you know what his thoughts were on capital gains because the uh, uh, taxes this is the new the new thing now. You know, everybody wants to to have when they want to have this corporate minimum tax they're trying to get this done globally um ireland i think is the cheapest right now in the world and uh, everybody's kind of ganging up on them and trying to get them to to you know raise their rates and the thing is these when a when a 
why does you know like if it's if the ceo is the founder which happens very often they're 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 uh, rewarded well and we need we need uh, low uh, capital gains taxes because of the fact that only about one out of ten uh you know new ideas or, or new companies that are started they're like you know, i'm talking about like you know high tech things you know biotech or you know electronics or something like that only about one in ten of those ventures are successful most of them fail so i thought capitalism have, worked you have to well, capitalism, capitalism does work. work capitalism does work but again people are trying well, to one in ten fail but they're only one Nine people, out of ten fail. Yeah, people are people are trying. Yeah, people are trying new things. You know, then there and you know new inventions and you know new things, and new products and things like that. And they're it's unsure. You know, there's uncertainty about how the marketplace is going to accept things. So by by having that um, by having that good uh, that p- potential to make a lot of money that keeps the capital equity keeps equity flowing in to these entrepreneurs to test their ideas out let's you know now sure you get you know because for every you know tesla there's been lots of other companies that have tried to make electric cars and failed but now but tesla is has been successful so 90 uh, percent of the investment look at, all, is, look at, is, look at is apple no, is, is wasted you know, they had to have apple computer had to have Equity investors had to, you know, commit a lot of money to Apple, and you know, and it hit. It became a big, you know, big thing, and they they were great, you know, and they've been rewarded for it. But again, there were lots of other companies trying to be Apple, but only, you know, out of you know, um, at least uh, nine out of ten, you know, you know, failed. So anyway, that's why we need low capital gains taxes, and that's why we you know we're going to reward people. Brad and all these other sour pusses that are, you know, mad because they, you know, worked at McDonald's and didn't make all the money they think they're worth because their because their degree in gender studies or whatever didn't, you know, help them make them rich. Uh, you know, they can go start their own company. Nobody's, Bob, Bob, stopping them. Bob, you know? if I design something, an engine, and ninety percent of the time I couldn't get it to work, and this is a system you're advancing. Let's say I designed an engine. I could never get it to work. A machine. And you well, say, if you oh, couldn't get it to oh, work, I doubt good. if you're going to get investors. I doubt if you're going to get too many investors if you have a if you have a, a prototype that doesn't work. That's a system that works. That's a system yes, yes. that doesn't work. Why I'm, would you? Why would you re- reward failure? Okay. It sounds like you're you're an errant feature. The predominant feature is failure. No, you have to, the, the, the thing is you have to have a significant possibility of reward in order to draw the capital in that need, that's necessary for these investments. Where are these entrepreneurs gonna get the money? You're just not gonna go down to the bank and say, hey, I have an idea for this new product. Yeah, and they go, well, what is it? Well, it'd be a text message that's 140 characters long. They would laugh you right out of the bank. You have you have to find you have to find investors that say, yeah, this this might be and this might be an idea. And this is this is how Twitter came along. But when they first you know went around trying to raise money, and people said, "What's your idea?" and they said, "Well, it's text messaging, basically, mm-hmm. with 140 character limit." People said, "Well, well, you're nuts. That would that would never work." Who? Who would want to write just 140 characters? Then it ended up becoming this big, you know, major. Now it's a major world force. But again, it takes vision, and you don't always know. Some people, maybe, you know, maybe the 140 characters thing would not have worked in the market. You, you don't know that. Nobody knows. You're you're breaking new ground. You want you want 90 percent of the people to take jobs in a in a factory an operation that's going to shut down. And you think this is your, this is a good idea for you, right? It is a good idea. It, uh, yeah, I mean, do they end people, up getting unemployed? Well, those people would. Rather, but, but what about? Sure, I mean, that's you know, you know, you don't know if if you're going to take take a job in a startup, okay, um, there's can, a chance can, that it may uh, it may to, not work. Back to the subject, please. Yeah, there, back to the subject. so so that's that's the thing, Charlie. 
And uh, so that's the, and that's the problem with, uh, with all these greens and socialists and Democrats and everything is they don't understand that you have to get, you have to be rewarded for the risk that you take the, 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 uh, there has to be a significant amount of money to be made to pay the investors back. Cause like I said, the investors are really the ones that are losing. Frank, you may want to turn on a light. So the investors are the ones that are losing uh, when a, when a new startup <laughs> fails, some guy that's working there on the assembly line or whatever, he, he's got nothing at risk. He's going to go to work and maybe he'll work there six months or a year, but he's getting his paycheck every two weeks and the company folds and he walks away and that's it. It's the investors that invested millions of dollars in this startup idea you know, for a new drug or a new uh, computer program or whatever. They're the ones that have their, you know, balls on the line. And a lot of times the, uh, the entrepreneur that started it, you know, his, he's very heavily personally invested himself and maybe so are his friends and his family all in on it with him as well. But uh, I'm not going to, I'm not going to fault the company for being successful for delivering like Amazon, like Jeff Bezos for delivering what the market wants. They want, people want good products at low prices d delivered fast. And that's what he gave them. And, uh, and he's reaping the rewards for it. All right. Now let someone else go. Okay. All right. All right, Charlie, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Bob. I, I really have some misgivings though that I think the people employed in the United States should be treated like pawns, the least uh, valuable chess piece that you seem to think a system in which they're manipulated is appropriate. All right, I'll be eclectic. First of all, thank you, uh, sir, for a nice uh, presentation outlining uh, your, some of your ideas for which you're seeking election to office and good, very good luck with your campaign. I hope we can jump start it in this way and you gain some experience uh, uh, taking some questions here. I'll be eclectic as usual here. Uh, I asked the Libertarian Party officers not too long ago, uh, what were their 10 key issues? What were the 10 issues they were going to campaign on? And there was utter and total silence. And I never got a response because they're just running on the same, same old uh, concepts over and over again and hoping something is going to change. Now you put together a campaign and I think the one thing you want to do is you want to listen to the voters and find out what those 10 issues are because they change every campaign and they change in every election. So you've got to ascertain what they are, and that way you're going to, you've only got one to three seconds with, when you're encountering a voter to get their attention. So you got to ascertain what their issue, they're calling the issues, not the candidates. Uh, There's another thing in the independent voters of Illinois, we're a bit traditionalist, but we like to look and in, in giving endorsements about candidates who put together viable campaigns i mean what you have and whatever that term viable means is is a subject to interpretation obviously getting um five thousand signatures is gonna it require a volunteer force uh volunteers in order to accomplish it within the time frames given so that's what I mean, putting together some sort of campaign in that regard to meet the first criteria, however just or unjust that may be. Um, they, they put those figures exactly, believe you me, the parties know that. And as I said many times, it explained to me, that's to keep the lightweights out of the election. You're darn tootin', they do it for that express purpose. So there's no other purpose. Is it unfair? You're entirely correct. All right. Um, yeah, another thing, you got to put together a campaign. Uh, from last I heard, a congressional district averages 750,000 voters spread out on quite a lot of territory. So how do you achieve reaching all of them um, is quite a task. 
And I would recommend sitting down and having this detailed out in some fashion. Uh, Jimmy Carter, in fact, wrote a book, a guideline to become president. And he succeeded, obviously. But it was all written down in advance. I'd like to know what the incumbents are doing or stand for in this campaign. Certainly, they're going to have some measure of influence on what it is. Now, getting over to uh, stories, that's a very interesting thing. It gets people's attention. However, for every story you tell, there is a counter story, such as the story I told about guns. So there's a limitation to that methodology. Um, capitalism works. <laughs> 90% of the companies fail. And then you maintain that this is the system that is successful or we should embrace. Now, if I had a job and 90% of my projects that I was assigned turned out to be another failure and disaster, I would not be employed very long. I took a devil in the boss and said, well, one out of, I did one out of 10, 10 things you told me to do correctly. So I didn't do so well on the other nine. <laughs> Come on, what criteria are you using? You can't get any worse. A system that succeeds only 10% of the time when it has absolute control over the market and that is the best it can do. And you reward CEOs for failure of this magnitude. That guy is right. He's entirely correct. They deserve that kind of compensation. You got to be kidding me. I wouldn't give him. A, I wouldn't give him twenty five cents. Um, now here's another one I like. All we need are antitrust laws. Oh, you're going to enforce antitrust laws against multinational corporations. How do you do that, my friend? How do you do that? It's easy to say, oh, yeah, we're just going to shut down all the multinational corporations, under regulate them under antitrust. No, I don't know if that's going to happen. Um, Good thing people uh, don't listen to you, Charlie. What? Good thing people don't listen to you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, good luck on the campaign. Yeah. Uh, you got some good ideas. Uh, I would advocate a bit more traditionalism. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll get you attention, putting out press releases on issues specific you've got the other thing is you've got to have issues specific to the district and do the research um that's what i mean how are things in the district themselves what are the predominant concerns what are the stations of people uh you know uh you mentioned some transportation issues i was thinking about that myself um, I don't know if that's going to be the top of the list in a rural area or Kiwani does have Amtrak. Nice brand new station, by the way. But anyhow, good luck on the campaign. Come back and report to us on your success. And we hope to see you inaugurated on Inauguration Day. Thank you. Anna, you wanted to say anything? It's now our rebuttal time. So we got a few minutes to, uh, plug something if you want to plug the green party or you want to say anything about our candidate or anything else guillermo do you want to do something too uh yes a couple of things i want to piggyback on what chuck uh, was talking about okay go ahead guillermo then Anna, you're going to need more than five thousand signatures because of knuckles and, and so on there's going to be one less congressional district in illinois that's why there will be more than 750,000 voters per district in Illinois. You're going to need an election attorney to take care of hearing objections, etc. And you're going to need a good media 
platforms, uh, websites, uh, blah, blah, blah. So those are items that I want to add to what Chuck was talking about. Thank you. Good, he knows the tree, he knows it. He's a, he's a election expert. <laughs> Well, IVI and IPO, uh, well, that, forget it. Uh, Chuck knows more about IVI and IPO than I do. Anybody else? Uh, yeah, Anne was going to tell us about the words. tell I'll us about something. the Green Party, Anna. Yeah, so uh, we do have a lot An of update. good candidate resources. Um, the back end websites, the databases for the canvassing, the uh, the phone banking. Um, I have uh, my candidate letters going out to the non corporate tax and unions. Um, so we're running big ticket campaigns, um, and we have a lot of uh, voters on our side. Um, I, when I canvassed uh, last year. Um, and earlier in this year, it was um, a lot of people don't want the two established parties. Um, so there is a lot of uh, leeway for us. The petitioning period is actually advantageous for us. Um, and um, so 2022 is gonna be a great year for independent new parties to, to come out ahead. And thanks for having uh, Brad on. <laughs> okay, I'll say something too. Um, if that's it, uh, this is Ellen. Is that okay, um, Tim? Hi. Uh, well, yeah, I'm sorry, thanks. Ellen. Yes, you got time. I was unmuted in my mic. Okay. Please speak. Yeah. Uh, so it's interesting. Um, you know, I have so many mixed feelings about running um you know with the green party i wasn't even aware that's what the topic was but uh because i was you know um it just seemed so the process is stacked against us but in my case last year i could have just been on the ballot with the um in the sixth district for um the woman just had to put me on there but then there were, you know, 10 people in the phone call and they said, um, reading my 10, 12 page letter of, you know, all the issues, I agree with all the pillars. Uh, these guys decided who were all Jewish from Rahm Emanuel's district, now Quigley's district, that I was anti-Semitic, which I'm not. But I couldn't, you know, because they said, one of the questions is why are you in this? And I said, well, the truth is my family's fortune got taken by the Manhattan Institute and the CIA and then the Mossad and all, you know, it turns out it's the Israeli mafia and they go, oh, she's anti-Semitic. Actually, I'm just against the Russian red Israeli Zionist Mossad that, that stole the promised software and uses their capacity to control the internet, control the conversation, control the elections, steal democracy. So I just simply said, you can't, you know, nothing's gonna work as long as there's a, an invisible empire, a new world order ruling our world. You know, I mean, I'm a capitalist. I, I voted for Reagan. I've been, you know, my stepfather is friends with Ian Rand. So I was libertarian, Alan Greenspan. I know all the capitalism. I've got an MBA. I've got a master's in teaching and, you know, so I, I just look at these things academically as a teacher. I, I think, you know, my gut has come back to at this stage to progressive, you know, a Jeffersonian Republican, a Democratic Republican, a Democratic Socialist, Christian Republican, Libertarian, Progressive. I don't care as long as it's not an invisible empire of tyrants and dictators and fascists and Nazis, you know, those are the ones I'm opposed to, but unfortunately they, their process, it's called, um, and the Mossad thing is by way of deception. So they've infiltrated, Rahm Emanuel is a perfect example. He's thought to be the, the North American leader of the Mossad. And um, he won't tell you that, 
just as anyone, the special forces are not allowed to tell you that their real, their real job is to, um, they will assassinate, kill, genocide, poison, bio warfare. Um, I had a guy stay here with me because he got, he was wrongfully imprisoned then, you know, um, but the CIA has always been essentially an invisible Nazi uh, police force, you know, of the empire that we can't see. There, Smedley Butler in the 30s, you know, the same people, the DuPonts, the, the people in 1913 who put in the, that captured the Federal Reserve, if you've heard of the book, The Creature from Jekyll Island, G. Edward Griffin writes about it, but they basically secretly went to Jekyll Island and agreed to privatize our central bank. And but backing these people were the Rothschilds who happened to be Jewish. And in 1776, this Jewish family got this great idea. We will send all of our five sons to France, to England, to they're in Germany, you know, and they end up, they come to America and we will lend money to the king or whoever's there um, for war. And they, they finance both sides. They make sure that there's always a war going on. And essentially the war that is going on is it, in the Cold War became the war of the rich against the poor, against the welfare, against the, the Browns, against the immigrants, against the, the, um, the retarded, the disabled. This is called eugenics, right? And we think, oh, we're past that. But it turns out, here's a, a great book, and I should put this on, um, this is Michael Crichton, a, a good Republican, I think, talking about how there's no such thing as uh, climate change, which, but then I, I think there probably is, but I think it's also a very good political issue, you know, because I know my stepfather, the libertarian who managed Ayn Rand and, and um, you know, all the others, didn't, he thought it was a it was a lie, a myth, you know, a convenient, you know, left wing democratic delusion. But um, it it is a perfect way to divide the left from the right, you know. And I I don't know, it's uh, like gun control and abortion and climate and and so you know you they've got us all mixed up and it traces back to Carl Schmidt. Hitler's crown jurist and the LaRouche people did write a great book on this. Uh, but so the guy that figured who helped Hitler get to office, Carl Schmidt, um, and he's the Justice Department basically. And um, Leo Strauss came over here. But and then also there's Reinhard Gellin, Hitler's head of intelligence against Russia. OK, those two guys basically started our Justice Department and our CIA. And they all their their infiltrated minions, and they created the state of Israel, and they're they're invisible, okay? And so they found this out in Italy with the um, propaganda duet when the, it, they went in and found at the Masonic Lodge the documents where Kissinger and Nixon and the Nazis and and Dulles and all these guys they planned that we will have use the strategy of tension. We will have little terrorist, false flag terrorist attacks, um, and that we'll always blame it on the other guy. 9-11, oh, the, you know, Israelis did it, oh, the, and, um, right, or blame it on the, the left wing, you know, the communists, that, mostly the communists. Keep this Cold War going, you know, send our special forces who are assassins, you know, through the, this came out of the OSS, is, which is like the SS, right, but this was Dulles. Casey, Casey was remember was Nixon and Kissinger's head of the CIA and the Justice Department. <laughs> These guys have been the Cold War was essentially we will infiltrate using like Strauss, you know, this Mossad, the um, an invisible army to bring about the Fourth Reich. So basically, we've been in the Cold War was World War Three, and now it's come out and we're in the Fourth Reich. It's basically the now. The Fourth Reich is upon us. They're, you know, they can put their knee on George Floyd's neck and leave it there. And um, and people go, wow. I mean, it's almost like they wanted it to go public, you know. And they're like, yep, 
Brad, from I hope you tell the attack. people FBI, of the fourth district one of them. about the fourth Reich. Okay. Uh -huh. of Kalani, Illinois. All right. Jim <laughs> Mars. It's written a book called Are the Fourth under the Reich. Fourth okay, Reich. read Jim Mars. Read right. these. Um, Okay. Read all what these people is that, that all right, goes Ellen, back I, to Kennedy assassination. Okay, okay? Ellen, I think it was an think, inside job. A perfect example. All, all right. right. I think we're gonna have to go. Anna, you wanna say anything else real quick? Campaign yeah, sure. Um, Brad is not officially the, the chapters do the recognition process, and so he has not been recognized yet. Are they working on getting a date for them? Um, anybody is welcome to submit a recognition questionnaire. Um, the Libertarian did. He also did not get on board. The Democrat did at one time. He did get on board. So it's just, you know, what those people in that jurisdiction actually want. So um, I was it's there not for necessarily a, a, you know, if you have five or six people who all happen to be friends of Rahm Emanuel's or somebody's. I don't know I mean, that. How is that. I don't think. I don't think any of them like Rom. Um, I, well, I will uh, ask. Alice, whoever this guy is that that blackballed me, y'all should look into it and survey us and let us tell you what went wrong, okay? Because I'll tell my whole story and I think something okay. went wrong. Whoever was there the was head of another Ellen, candidate Ellen, let's, that let's, they went with. Yeah, okay. right. How many people have been backstabbed and screwed over? You know, Cynthia McKinney. What went wrong? Y'all should figure that out. Well, I kind of politics. I, I, I have a feeling that uh, never mind. I'll, I'll keep it some other time. All right. Uh, if there's no wait other a minute, questions. wait a minute, wait a minute. She disparaged the name of the Green Party, and that doesn't work. I'm sorry, pal. <laughs> All the candidates were treated fairly and equitably, and given eight, you know, nobody was mistreated. That's but, totally Charlie, tell true. him why did you abdicate when it came to me? Because was it because I'm anti-Semitic? That was the reason they gave me I'm for not letting you, me be on there. I've got a PBA and this, and you abdicate. You it said, might oh, I be can't the fact, Ellen, that her. you're not doing I mean, some self-examination. What self -examination. kind of fair process is that? They're full of backstabbers, starting with him, the no, FBI. There is nothing unprofessional in, one, in any fashion whatsoever. Charlie, you are the dirtiest process. political operative in the whole world. That's why you run Absolutely this and you should nothing. be pushed out now. Okay. All right. Absolutely uh, nothing. Okay, some people Guillermo, are selected and yeah. some people are not. All right. Guillermo Boom wants to say shit. something. Yeah. Boom shit. You're in there. All right, Ellen. We're gonna, we're gonna, Ellen, Ellen. Okay, I have the right to fame yeah. you, Ellen. not the Green Party. I dirty politics that get in there and infiltrate and ruin everything, Charlie. You're the number one offender. Uh, I think not, Ellen. I think it may have been <laughs> a, a little bit of an anger problem yeah. somewhat. <laughs> anyway, here, go ahead. A politician should have one. Yeah, a politician should have good personality. I have seen uh, working through crowds, through the you nice and smooth and easy by Edward Doliak, Jane Byrne, and Neil Harrigan, and I've seen some real lousy politicians that turned me off. I remember one night, Blagojevich uh, said on his first night, he walked up to the podium and he said, I have an uncle, Dick Mel. And everybody clapped. I walked out with a couple of guys that I knew. So that's terrible. About Rami Manuel, I cannot say anything negative or tasty because he gave me a citywide resolution signed uh, by Rami Manuel and the city council. So thank you, Ram. Uh, sorry about it. Okay, that's oh, what I wanted to say. Great, yeah. Anybody else, real quick? All right. Uh, Brad, you get the last word and take as long as you need. All righty. Um... Uh, that's a lot to take in. Uh, the first thing I want to say is, on the world stage, the Democrats are not left. We are left. Just want to make sure I clarify that. Uh, as far as the question on um, the mixed genders or whatever that was about, <clears throat> there's a nice video on YouTube on the SciShow where they explain there's at least six different genders. That's the thing. There's not two. 
Uh, I mean, are you going to include hermaphrodites and all that? Uh, I suppose that you could say it's kind of a mess, but there are actually more than two genders. It's not male and female. As far as the sports go, I mean, I guess they have to regulate that at the Olympics or whatever they're going to do. Uh, as far as nuclear power, I say, at what cost? Are we going to have another Chernobyl? I mean, probably not, but it could happen again. It has happened twice before. Uh, there, there's a company in Germany that has proposed setting up solar panels all across the Sahara Desert. And the idea is there's enough power going from, from the sun into that area to power the whole world for a year in only six minutes. So I say green energy is absolutely possible and way, way more powerful than what we have now. And the cost, uh, the cost of life is basically zero. There's no emissions from electricity being generated by geothermal or wind or solar. Uh, what else? Um, and we're not mad at the CEO for him being successful. We're mad at him because he robbed us. There's a difference. If I came into the middle, into your house in the middle of the night and robbed you, would you cheer on my success or would you pissed off that I robbed you? That's the difference. Uh, other than that, I do, I do like all of you guys. I respect all of your opinions. We are all Americans and we all have to share the same boat. And I know that if shit hit the fan, I'd have your back and you'd have mine. So I'd like to end on a positive note, as I normally do. Love, peace, and respect. And good night. All right. At this point, I'm going to stop the recording of the College of Complexes, but we'll keep the uh, we'll keep the uh, line. Very good. Very good. Okay. Thank you. Good luck. Come back and report on your campaign. <laughs>